one thing they all had in common. From that moment, it was no longer possible to believe any story which supposed that at any time, now, there could be created once again the beginning of life. Most people believed that creation had not stopped with the Bible. They thought that the sun breeds crocodiles from the mud of the Nile. Mice were supposed to grow of themselves in heaps of dirty old clothes. And it was obvious that the origin of blue bottles is bad meat. Maggots must be created inside apples. How else did they get there? All these creatures were believed to come to life spontaneously without the benefit of parents. Hey, Google. No, no. All lights red. We wasted enough time already. Let's get with the program. <laughs> All right. Oops. What the hell? There we go. Well, let's start off with the first video. Are you ready for this? The fact is that there are two traditions of explanation that march side by side in the ascent of man. One is the analysis of the physical structure of the world. The other is the study of the processes of life, their delicacy, their diversity, the wavering cycles from life to death in the individual and in the species. And these traditions do not come together until the theory of evolution. Because until then, there is a paradox which cannot be resolved, which cannot be begun about life. We see it about us in the birds, the trees, the grass, the snails, in every living thing. The manifestations of life, its expressions, its forms, are so diverse that they must contain a large element of the accidental. And yet, the nature of life is so uniform that it must be constrained by many necessities. I, I was surprised, considering how in the earlier program was so much about structures and kind of structuralism, that in a sense, he started out with that. I mean, why didn't he start out with Mendel, the guy who discovered genetics? I mean, that would be, seems to me, more in the logical way of thinking. I like the way that he waited till then, but it seems like this whole thing about, you know, having a system that grows and does what is thing, that, that seems more like, Mendel seemed more like logic. <laughs> Was this seems to uh, emphasize something else? Was he doing that on purpose? Because he, oh, yeah. his earlier programs have all been a kind of reduction of the logic to find out the structures. Phil, I, my 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 approach on this was, I mean, I'm absolutely, I agree with Scott. I, I'm I'm blown away by the series. And as you watch through, or when you watch through this episode, did you notice that he's he's really laying the groundwork for that? Uh, you know the, that chemical, like that um, biology sort of substrate that is actually um, that is going to be revealing itself. He kind of seems to be setting the stage for the, the the genetic discoveries, and that and that seems to come from uh, you know throughout this episode, right? That's what it seems like to me. I mean, he did talk about it earlier on when he talked about the, the um, not so much Mendel, but in, in DNA, but he's talked about DNA before. Oh, here we go. Okay, uh, it's, uh, episode 12 actually is all about Mendel, uh, Phil. You'll be glad to know. So so he's, he's, he's being St. John's about this. And I, uh, well, actually, D Dave will know the answer. Uh, when did Mendel live? Should I take this out before, here? Before, before Darwin. For sure. No, before, after, after, right? Mendo is after. Mendo right? is after? No, I don't think so. I think it's 19 something. 
I think he I wasn't he a medieval monk or something? Oh no 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 yeah I, 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 yeah it's earlier. But but Mendel only discovered the pattern, okay? But there's no idea of Jin, right? So I don't think that's why it's not there as a foundation for that. Because he only know the pattern, okay? So that's that's this one, this kind of P and this kind of P will come with this, right? He 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 has no theory foundation on that. So probably at that time it's totally unrelated. In their point of view, yeah. Every, everybody okay. knows the story. So, 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 so Darwin and Wallace independently came up with this around 1840, and Mendel did his pea plant experiments between 1856 and 63. So 16 years after these guys had realized, oh yeah. my God, it's Malthus. <laughs> Malthus explains the the yeah. variety in neg entropy. It was 16 years after that that Mendel did his pea plants. Okay. Okay. Malthus, Malthus produces the problem. The populations will grow exponentially. Yeah. That's the source of the problem that leads them both to the solution. And it, it's only the survival, it's only the ones who survive who survive. Oh, wow, there's the answer. But all, all you need then is a source for novelty. Right, right. And Mendel will, will make that clear because right now it's you can't you can't know you, you don't know that it's digital the way it is. Hmm. So when he, when he made this, when Bruno says this thing here about the, the, the diversity, I thought, well, how come the diff differences in rocks or the strata inside of rocks and the differences in mountain shapes and clouds, those are all, are all sources of diversity. What's, what's, what's the amazing thing about the diversity in the manifestations of life? And I thought, oh, I know what it is. Because things, these things are diverse but self-maintaining. So it's like a valid diversity. If, so, if something is fluid and constantly changing, it doesn't even count as an item. So it can't even... But the geology is constantly changing, but fluid. I mean, and it produces this variety, right? Is that it doesn't disappear and reproduce it generationally because we don't see it generationally? But they knew they were beginning to develop this idea of long term uh, geological change, right? So, your point about the diversity of, you know, Things were linked because of their similarities, but there was huge diversity in layers and places on the earth. Well, there was also the uh, there's there's also diversity in life. I think I think the key point here is that Probably. life is uh, self-producing. I, I think that's true. You know, like in other words, uh, in order to sustain itself, because it can't it can't be permanent. Well, I I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm not sure if some single cells are not permanent. So, all, all viruses are per not permanent. So he, he opens up talking about the paradox, and, he, and he's saying all along in the scientific world, there's these two interests going along in parallel. One is the physical, and one has to do with life. But life is a problem because, what does he say? We see it around us, the birds, the trees, the grass, the snails, every living thing. It is this. The manifestations of life, its expression, its forms are so diverse, that they must contain a large element of the accidental. And yeah. yet the nature of life is so uniform that it must be constrained by many necessities. So there he's, he's talking about what, I mean, and this is Jacques Renaud writes about this in Chance and Necessity. When we recognize a system as living, and, and remember in his book, he distinguishes between crystal formation and, and real organisms like bacteria, which are incredibly intelligent and adaptive. What is it, how do we distinguish between, between um, regular geometrical cell valorization in the crystal and this other thing? And, and it's, I don't know, if it's, it's hard to say, but I guess, just, I saw a video just the other day. It's going viral on TikTok. It's gorillas <laughs> finding a baby snake in their in their grass in the zoo. Have you seen this thing? No. So, a, a, like a young gorilla finds a baby snake in the hall. The gorillas gather around and they're like this, looking at the snake, and they're mm. and they're cooking it. And you can see they know that that's not a twig. So, so, so something something something's going on. And then, but it's not simple movement either because branches don't cause consternation. So what, what is it that we're not, I, yeah, this is a silly question, I guess. So what is the unity of life? W when people postulated a vital force and we say, oh, that thing has the vital force and this other thing over here doesn't. But the corpse is also moving in a way. It's, it's, if you look at it over time, it's bubbling and dissolving into the grass. It's being eaten and stuff like this. So how do we really distinguish between life infested material clumps and ones that lack this thing? Maybe it's, they move fast enough to make us feel threatened, Scott. I don't know. I'm, yeah, not, I'm not joking because living things that grow slowly 
don't make us feel threatened. And we have to, oh, that's really alive too. It's, it's a, an ivy. You know, it's actually growing. It takes some realization to think it's even growing, not just a thing that is barely animate. And, you know, a mold or a, a moss. Okay, you, it looks like the tree. I guess it's growing too if the tree's growing. But the thing, the snake that's slithering around, it can bite your toe. It could do something, you know, it's like spiders too. And they're all moving and it's, like, it's not threatening. So the crystals... The differences of the crystals, which are quartz crystals that are all different, and the differences of the snowflakes that are unique, and the cells that they each have varieties. We're not going to define life by variety alone. Oh, but but they but they knew this before this discovery. I mean, people, even the ancients knew the difference between an animal and a plant. I mean, and, and they know that they were both alive. It's okay, its own but, It contains its own sense of motion. Yeah, but, but, it's David, I, I think you're restricting this to like, um, uh, I, I guess, it, would the right term be like a phenomenology? This is not an experience that we're experiencing. This, you can have a tardigrade as a, as a life form, right? You, you can't see it except for on a, yeah, that's a good impression of a tardigrade. Yeah, well, that's, that's true, David, but that was the question I was asking. How is it that we and other primates make a draw sharp line between the living and the unliving? Because it seems so natural to us, and and what, one thing you just mentioned is the size. That definitely, like, look at the germ theory. They thought it was they thought it was miasma. They thought it was some gassy, some spiritual gas. And then, uh, and today's other point is threat. What what stimulates the attention of an organism that's survival interested? Survivotropic. Well, survivotropic things are paranoid. That's that's what they do. So they're looking for fast motion and potential death. I think that's a good so, point. So yeah. so if if you go back to to the real primitives. Don't they make the distinction in the sense that, uh, like, although you don't eat all of them, uh, you could eat life. Yeah, you don't go out eating a rock. I mean, you know, like, so so maybe that's the reason that that there's something similar between them and us, because they not only move around, they they devour things, and and we eat them, and you know, you got to be careful which one not to eat because some are poisonous. I mean, like, I I. They they knew from the beginning. They just didn't know how to explain what life was. Yeah, so they all, everybody knew. Even e even the ape man knew it was a living thing. And well, <laughs> saying that the primates handicapped in this conversation. Guys. Yeah, we're we're handicapped in this conversation. Scott's brought a really good point up here. Mm -hmm. Now there's 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 things that we're aware of, and then there's things that we were not aware of. Right? I mean. From and then the unknown unknowns. What's that? And then there are the unknown unknowns. Then the unknown <laughs> unknowns, which are. But Scott's bringing up a point about I think that the, you know, what what triggers our um, uh, like our reactions to this is alive. So this mm -hmm. is this is alive. This isn't alive. And and we're talking. I think he's more referring to like a primate species or other living creatures. To recognize when some things are alive, but you know, does does the um, does the hippo know that it has a a symbiotic relationship with the you, you know the bacteria on its back or the you know the other animals that are around it? I don't know. I maybe it's it doesn't even come into its its mammalian consciousness. Maybe it's not even aware of it. Maybe it's just like a, an itch on its back. And, or, and maybe 99% of our recognition faculties are spontaneous, bio-based. Like, I'm wondering, you, you know how we, we have a special love for the alien uh, chest burst scene in the movie Alien? That's like, that's like the most precious moment in cinema history. <laughs> maybe there's a connection with these apes, because the, the zookeeper said that these, these, the gorillas had never seen a snake before, but they immediately recognized tiny thing, dangerous, might go up inside of me. I mean, it, it just... It just because it's a size that it could enter into an orifice, and I think well, we have we have a yeah. special we have a special loathing for animals entering into us and laying eggs inside of us. I, right, and think about the power of eyes, which is another layer on that. Anything that looks like it has an eye, you have this predator response to, right? You fear yeah. it's coming after something. Why does it have those eyes there? Well, so, that's a great point. That that explains you know Sartre makes a big deal about the gaze and and the, and the the crashing of of 
good, healthy existential consciousness, which which is pure subjectivity, pure freedom. He says, you feel like you're you're the gaze that's that's ranging over all of space and everything before you is an object until someone walks in front of you and looks at you. And then you feel like you're a thing, you're a rock, you're on a bench, you're an object. Someone else is looking at you like, oh my God, you've crashed into concreteness and being an object for other people. So, uh, so that's, and he makes such a big deal about it, this strong break between being the only subject in a space and then having another subject enter, then you're like, shit. And then you crash into being an object. Even if it's not a human, you know you're being looked at and it's creepy. Cats it's look at you, creepy, you cats, creepy, man. You got to bring the other uh, famous uh, scene in 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 uh, in a movie about an object or like a living creature going into an orifice. You know the Wrath of Khan, the the little thing. Oh yes, is. yes. Oh, that was, you're right. You're right. That's another great moment in Deep Biohar. The the, the little tiny uh, 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 right, uh, armadillo right. scorpion thing. Remember that? Oh fuck that 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 just oh i should have had that clip ready daniel we need to prepare next time that's what that's that's up right up there with with great biohar so you're we're, 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 ricardo Montalban plucks a baby monster from the mother monster in a fish tank and drops it in Chekhov's ear i don't know if you remember this scene yeah it's it, bad it, it's ha bad. having an animal go into your ear and then into your yeah. brain is bad yes all right all right well uh, we'll, we'll add that for the visitors uh, uh, later on. What do you think? They killed 20 of my people. Oh, not all at once. Not instantly, to be sure. You see, their young enter through the ears and wrap themselves around the cerebral cortex. Uh, this has the effect of rendering the victim extremely susceptible to uh, suggestion. No. <laughs> All right, here's, let's see, here's the next clip. The five years that he spent on the ship transformed him. He had been a sympathetic, subtle observer of birds, flowers, life in his own countryside. But South America exploded all that for him. He came home convinced that species are taken in different directions when they are isolated from one another. Species are not immutable. But when he came back, he could not think of any mechanism that drove them apart. That was in 1836. At that time, Wallace was a boy in his teens. All right, well, I threw that in there because I thought this is an important point, is that they recognize something's going on. They recognize all these life forms have something in common. When is it? Oh, the Sky Father made them all. That's, and they're all, they're all interested in survival. But then there's this other, this other issue is if they really have something in common and they, and they follow this tree model that we all know now, a common ancestor and then splitting, what is it that drives the, the variation and takes them in different directions? So I wonder what it would be like to be a school kid back then and talk about life in the classroom but not know the mechanism of mutation combined with uh, environmental pressure. Well, did he recognize that the cockroach is 100 miles over there and the cockroach is 100 yeah. miles over here? actually had any relationship in any way other than the fact that you know we're classifying did he think of them as having been bred from the same original animal was he really thinking of a tree like that is that what was said in this i'm not oh, sure yeah. i'm not sure how yeah i'm not sure either no he he was saying he he said that that that, that 
the different species, in a sense, diverged because they were isolated and they had time to emerge. But but Wallace, I, I rather like Wallace better because Wallace kind of show that they could be very close to each other and uh, they're very, very different from each other. So therefore, there's something else other than isolation and distance. There's something that seems seems to me, he, Wallace didn't say this, but something about some special uh, specialization within the structure itself that emerged that, that's not just out of isolation. And, and so isn't, divergence, isn't divergence the heresy here that these are not fixed things. These are changing over time. That's the heresy, right? I think so, yeah. Because he, yeah. I picked up on a word that he said, which is immutable. And immutable really triggers, um, you know, something uh, like a universal, right? And religious, the religious presumption. Well, not for me, not necessarily. Immutable is actually a really um, like philosophical term. It's a quest for the absolute, right? In terms of knowledge and, uh, you know, like the, the platonic or the, not the platonic ideal. We don't want to get into platonic ideals, but we like, say, for example, the Pythagorean theorem, it's immutable, right? This A squared, B squared, C squared sort of thing, right? It's everywhere. It's ubiquitous. That kind of language. Now, when he uses it in that sentence, that as, as in terms of species, I think there is, it's an upsetting of, the apple cart, I'm going to be kind of mixing my, my things here or combining them, but it's the, it, it's bringing it into, it's, it's like, uh, well, it's overturning the religious thought, which we know is what happened, <clears throat> right? And maybe like all of God creatures had something that was similar, which would have been God, <clears throat> but it was the natural, it, it was the, um, it, it was, it, it was the variations as far away as, I think he could see them when Darwin was on his explorations, he could see that a species would 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 vary just miles away. Hmm. Well, the, well, that's a good question. I, I don't know if, I don't, so yeah, that's right. How, how common and how far back were they thinking? Were, were they thinking, okay, there's the basic bird type and then the bird type varies? Or were they saying there's a type of bird and that has subtypes and then thanks to <laughs> Island ghettoization, the subtypes begin to flourish. So, so right. yeah, that's so that, the giant tree of life, which was comprehensive of everything. Right. Well, yeah. it, it look, I mean, the, the program is called the ladder of creation. What happens is if you, if you have this theory, it, it, it is heresy because, in this sense, because cre these creatures, in a way, are self creating in its own way. In other words, not necessarily. Now he didn't say. I think he was very religious, so he was afraid of saying that. Not necessarily were they created by God, but somehow they evolved, and the ladder means the, the step ladder one after another rung, right? So therefore, remember, even the lowly fly before that, uh, 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 they they just come out of the dirt. I mean, they just come out of the dirt magically, and they were originally like the fly. You know, so therefore, in a sense, I retain its original form that I suppose God created, even though this just came out. <laughs> it was there was no parents, and until they discovered, no, there was something else going on, right? Yeah. And we, we have some, we have some clips about that coming up too. Yeah, it's coming up. Yeah, I always loved spontaneous generation, and it seems so silly nowadays. But a bit back then, I think that's a more fun world to live in because people want to talk to their tables and chairs, like Pee Wee Herman and Pee Wee's Playhouse. I think we'd like to, to animate the environment around around us, and Spontaneous Generation gives us that feeling that maybe that table is right on the verge of like <clears throat> getting its shit together and talking and you know coming to life. You know, yeah, I think making uh, the chanted it makes it makes all the world like proto proto vital. I think like, well, actually, it, it is proto vital. Actually. I think Jason yeah. wants to talk, you guys. Yeah, I like to. Talk. I, I watched the video. I, I, that's great, you know. I, I I regret I didn't watch for the last night, you know, because I I, I have other committed to doing this time. So I just thought I feel like you know I would better watch it. So I, today I watch it. So uh, I I think the I the the thing I learned is the Wallace is very keen observer. Okay, mm -hmm. so look at the, before he was in England. England is a place. I, I never travel around England, but I assume it's very similar to Japan. There's a very complete landscape, and he's interested in the beetle. So he's been doing uh, the landscape, uh, uh, land surveyor. 
he's able to see the just like a uh, 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 field talk about even miles away the beetle you will see the difference so here he probably already know a lot of thing over there and then he take a job travel to south america to amazon that's a totally different environment and i believe as a keen observer he probably can see they have the beetle here and no doubt about it they are beetle but they they and for sure they are different okay so i think that's the the the, the nature you know he start to figure out okay that's the different and one thing shocked me is about the human he look at i think probably in the later clip he uh, observed the uh the the native indian over there they are closeness they are naked they are praying they are happy and his conclusion is interesting he say they are not far they are uh their civilization is not that far away from us yeah okay. i think that's a very interesting uh, uh, conclusion because he i believe uh, a lot of uh, civilized men in england at that time when they see that they probably will classify these people as monkey or ape this guy not human but i believe because his keen observation doing in england right so he knows he probably look at a different way so he figured out these human are very close their civilization is is very close it's not far away from we are as an english man so yeah. that's why he put out everything so that's the part and i really like wallace you know and i hope we should read the, the oh yeah i was i, I love that and, and bruna points out how mature and sure he sounds bringing his notebooks in the amazon for the first time and he's already talking like a journalist so i'm not surprised i mean he must have felt great he must have felt like like neil armstrong because here he is being a non-asshole non-racist and and being like holy shit, this is a scientific method i'm i'm going to repress all of my prejudices as much as possible and let the data just bloom in front of me so he said that that this that the noble savages besides being noble and healthy and close to nature they were closer to philosophers than apes and that was the Oh, okay. well, but the, but the contrast interesting to Darwin, the contrast to Darwin, right? Well, the interesting to me though is that both Darwin and Wallace uh, discover who who is this guy, you know, that that said it's because uh, animals grow faster, the population grow faster than food, and so therefore uh, what they have to struggle, and the struggle uh, finally becomes the the, the in a sense a, a kind of will to power. So I was I was thinking like why did not Wallace catch on because he was poor and he never really got his thing off the ground and I think uh, Darwin was a little bit richer so therefore the power game actually in terms of money actually won out because I th I thought hey, Wallace was the more Phil, sensitive Phil, Phil. Hey, Phil, more they more both, sensitive they both, observer Phil they both wrote the same thesis yeah but who 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 do we remember who do we remember the one, one, the one who oh, deferred. No, Wallace deferred to have Darwin take the credit. And Darwin said he was very generous about it. Remember? Yeah, yeah. So they, they but they both. That's the strange thing about this is a good like Marxian type point. Two people, yeah. different individuals at the same time in the same culture, came up with the same idea, and and they even referred it to the same book. So that, that just shows you how raising people and, and, and giving them a nice Japanese you know, habitat to sit in, in, and collect things in uh, will, will produce the same brand new insight. It was like Leibniz and Newton again. It was like <laughs> there's there, there, there in this world of proto mechanics and then suddenly, oh my God, if I keep making it thinner and thinner and thinner, can I divide by infinity in a, in a, in a way if I divide the numerator also by infinity? And holy shit, they both what? came up with yeah, isn't this a Hegelian necessity of progress? The ideas become content for the next possible idea, and you have to have developed these prior ideas in order to get to the next stage. But once you have reached this point, they're ready to stew together and create the next phase. The dialect is to put them together because the idea of the raw, they're all going to be born but they're not going to be able to survive because they're out. Well, well, you, don't seem to understand. The food. You, you don't seem to understand my point. I think Wallace was a much more subtle observer of, of the situation. He appreciated that the, the natives of the, of the Amazon was much, uh, much similar to us. And so in the sense of he had won 
we would not have the kind of colonialism. Colonialism <laughs> already started, but we wouldn't have the kind of degradation of others that, that we do, we ended up with because, you know, Darwinism became a kind of a, 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 a power that let people to generate a kind of, uh, uh, how should you say, a, a kind of uh, living Darwinism where they judge people by the head shape and all that. Wait, man. That's right. That's, that's an excellent. Yeah, with the boom for racist. Yeah, these the, the dominator classes always like to use biology as kind of like a, as, as like as a trick to get people to, to join them. But that's a great idea for a story. You know, Philip K. Dick's Man in the High Castle. What if Germany had won the war? You could write a story about what if Walls had published first. Maybe there wouldn't be this the dark skinned inhuman others who were allowed to bomb and we but we can make deals with them like give us your oil or we'll kill you i mean we're giving them a choice but the, the whole thing might have changed yeah you're right I, 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 I kind of when i watched beginning i kind of expect that they were talking about the the harbor spencer but it turned out that they didn't talk about harbor spencer so uh, when we talk about darwin is a uh, harbor spencer i don't know is harbor spencer uh, is responsible or not you know so you know, I, I i see fear make a good point you know look guys uh waters is a much happier nicer person than darwin uh, of course i don't know darwin much but you know some I, I i have to raise my hand i don't agree at all with that because well, which point you don't agree you don't i don't agree with the fact that there could be a total different social spin on on who who was labeled or branded with, or took priority with with the evolutionary claim? Oh, okay. okay. No, no, no. I, I'm not arguing. No, no, I'm not, I'm Jason. I'm not actually now responding to you. I'm saying it was more of a fill this point because the issue is is that imagine this. Okay, there's it's not social Darwinism. It's social Wallaceism. Really, I mean, imagine a world that that's what it was. Right. It's that's the same principle. They, they both read the paper in the Royal Society and it fell stillborn into a group of people that basically no one really paid attention to it, even in the Royal Society at the time that the papers were read. So okay? Now, it, it's what happened afterwards. In fact, I think, and I've heard that, that Darwin didn't get his, his, um, his work kind of hibernated, and same probably with Wallace, but you have to, in, in evolutionary studies, they study both works, right? They study both works, and I don't. I don't think it's like uh, socially tainted because Wallace had more of a uh, a romantic uh, view of of native uh, populations. I don't think it would have went on a trajectory where our whole colonialism would have been like upset because we would have attributed the branding of 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 evolutionary. Uh, foundations to Wallace over Darwin. I I just don't buy that. Yeah, that's, that's probably right. This is the same attitude. This is the same, attitude. Attitude. Uh, this is the same attitude that we have for when we develop the nuclear bomb, because the knowledge is more important than the human beings or other living things. Uh, you you've got to weave a kind of the ethics and the uh, the concern for others uh, into the knowledge. Rather than say the the knowledge will get us there because people will always abuse the knowledge uh, for, to whatever they want to. But even if Wallace wrote a book and, and and gave like more flattering sketches than Darwin, and all of a sudden people thought, wow, those dark skinned others with the high cheekbones, they're ethical and they take care of their children too. They love their babies too, and they would be humanized and all this stuff. Nonetheless. Uh, as as the capitalism developed and, and people saw, well, they have so much cane sugar and so many precious metal. Oh my God, and they work for nothing. We can just give them glass beads. They would just come up with another story. They would say like, yes, uh, Wallace is right. They're really lovely people, but um, they don't know Christ. Or they'd come up with, some, there'd be some other thing ready to go in, in order to, to, to uh, legitimize their colonialism, don't you think? So even if Wallace said, actually, they're, they're better than white people, they're, they're more compassionate and they're more spontaneously cooperative than we are, we should be like them. There'd still be something ready to go in order, in order for imperialism to continue, don't you think? Yeah, I think you're right because uh, I was writing in the chat that, you know, in one sense, you can publish the same theory two ways called survival of the fittest, meaning the superior, the culture will, with the, the stronger, better, the better ones will survive. And Wallace's claim was it was the survival of the most varied and most adapted to the local environment. That's not the same as saying fittest. That's saying they fit into their local environment, but their other environments, the implications. 
It's not a superiority chain, but you do what Scott says and you integrate that with a material history, which is, well, we want the iron, we want the gold, we want what they have, and we have the iron weapons. Then it becomes our culture will overtake this culture with power for their material. And yeah, it turns out there's, there is a superiority race in that. It's the armed superiority. And, and there are times in history where you don't even, you don't need to justify it. Like it's only later that we're like, well, we're allowed to kill the Jews because as you know, they eat children and that's not a good thing. That's a bad thing. And they kill Jesus. I mean, and some people are writing in books, oh, that's really wrong. That's really, we shouldn't do that. But they're in the army and they're doing what they're told and they're fighting, you know, the good fight, you know, what do you do? The leaders told them to do it. When he was 25, Wallace decided to become a full-time naturalist. It's an odd Victorian profession. It meant that he would have to keep himself by collecting specimens in foreign parts to sell to museums and collectors in England, and Bates would come with him. So the two of them set off in 1848 with 100 pounds between them. They sailed to South America and then a thousand miles up the Amazon to the city of Manaus, where the Amazon is joined by the Rio Negro. Yes, that was a cheesy video. It didn't have much to say, but I, it, it, I, I didn't know until I watched this little piece that naturalists were a vocation and that they were paid according to the weird stuff that they brought back to collectors. I thought, oh, the, yeah. I thought these were just science-minded Boy Scouts but actually, it, it, it's something that you could do. It was like, I guess, like there were 49ers of like exotic species and then bringing stuff back to sell. I didn't know for, that. For, for museums and private collectors, I guess, right? That's right. That's cool. All right, now, so here, here's the video Phil was talking about. And grave diggers. He was excited when, for the first time, he went into a native Indian village. The most unexpected sensation of surprise and delight was my first meeting and living with a man in a state of nature with absolute uncontaminated savages. They were all going about their own work or pleasure which had nothing to do with white men or their ways. They walked with the free step of the independent forest dweller and paid no attention whatever to us, mere strangers of an alien race. In every detail, they were original and self-sustaining, as are the wild animals of the forests, absolutely independent of civilization, and who could and did live their own lives in their own way as they had done for countless generations before America was discovered. It turned out that the Indians were not fierce, but helpful. Wallace drew them into the business of collecting specimens. During the time I remained here, 40 days, I procured at least 40 species of butterflies quite new to me, besides a considerable collection of other orders. One day, I had brought me a curious little alligator of a rare species, which I skinned and stuffed, much to the amusement of the Indians, half a dozen of whom gazed intently at the operation. Uh, I, I chose that video because I wish I was the kid on the front of the boat facing backwards while the boat was going down the stream. I was like, it just doesn't get any better than that, sitting on that boat going down the water like that. And then, of course, the comedy of, uh, of Wallace stuffing the alligator. Or the, uh, and then the, what, like, what were, the, what were the, uh, the natives thinking? Like, these, I mean, just like, they would have to make an inference about in their culture, this happens because, and I, I thought that was funny. Uh, I was I was shocked to a degree that f first of all, the Wallace was brave enough to venture into an unknown tribe, and he found out how friendly they were. That in a sense they accepted others coming in without threatening them. So they were not about power; they were about cooperation because they even helped them collect butterflies yeah. so therefore that so these indians didn't lose because they were less intelligent or less whatever they lost because they didn't have the will to kill other people 
They just accept that other people for heaven's sakes. You know, and, 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 and so therefore, if you're going to call it that way, it is that Western society has this, this will to be dominant because the food will run out. You're going to go out and get it. And if somebody stands in your way, you're going to kill them, right? That's all instinct. And these guys, they didn't have that instinct. In fact, they sort of watch him, you know, stuff this alligator. It's like, what the hell is this guy doing? It's something weird. But they're going to accept it, you know. So they were at least very tolerant of others. And we're not. That's where the problem is. That's right. It must have been a happy moment in history to, to leave planet whiteness, go somewhere else and say, oh, geez, maybe does this reflect something about me? Am I intrinsically this way? This is like Rousseau's idea, I guess. Like, like mm -hmm. if, if I hadn't been raised in a competitive, shitty environment, would I be naturally monkey-like? No, actually, that's not that. Would I be naturally aggressive and selfish and antisocial? Or would I be automatically super cooperative, like almost acting like in a, in a Borg kind of connection with other people, which for me is like utopia. You know, I think they are the hunter and the gatherer. So they are like welcome guest is share is a common uh, morality. If he uh, what is wrong into the agricultural society, I believe they would be different. For example, go to the other place, you know, so. Well, except, except if he stayed there and, 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 and become like them, he would have the knowledge that soon enough, somebody's going to come over and take over the village. So in other words, you have to live in this state of innocence because if you already know that somebody has this mentality of conquering and taking away from you, then in a sense, you will not be as innocent. You'll be much more suspicious of somebody coming in to your village because they just want to take over. Yeah, I, I read one book you talk about this kind of society. Basically, their morality is a little bit different, you know. So, uh, like us, we have to ask something, but they to share something. But for them, the share is the common. If you reject to share, okay, then you have to come up with some reason. So that's kind of the opposite than 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 what we uh, we we learn in our society. Phil's point about the, all it takes is one bad apple, then everyone has to has to be up in arms. This has always haunted me. So mm -hmm. I, I always try to step to the left of whomever I'm talking to because I think it's a duty to make my short life as good as you know, helpful, useful as possible before it's over. But my dad used to bring this all the time. He's like, you, you know, you, you myopic socialist idiot. Don't you realize all it takes is one bad nation or individual? And this forces everyone to become defensive, aggressive, paranoid, selfish, collect, surplus, and start hoarding. So in other words, all you need is one hoarder, and then everyone has to be a hoarder to save themselves. And I thought, shit, and I, and I couldn't come up with a counter argument. But that's just a theory. It's a hypothetical. There's no sociological proof of such a thing. Yeah, it's, a game, it's a game theory question. Right, right. Uh, well, it's okay. iterations. How are you iterating? Yeah. What about the, um, have you guys heard of, I, I mean, I don't know, I don't know what the, um, the support is behind this, but have you guys heard of the, the hawks and the do the doves? Yeah. It's that, that kind of thing. Like that, that there's a certain amount of hawks and dove personalities required in society for it to be, you can't have a society uh, full of altruists and these kinds of things, right? Now, I'm not advocating for it, but I think that's kind of where the conversation will go. Um, I did find the, um, it was actually, I think Adorno actually, going back to a point, I wanted to read something. This comes from chapter six of George Steiner's Grammars of Creation. And he says, working out of a Marxist Leninist eschatology, George Lukacs proclaimed that a thinker and an artist were responsible to the end of time, not only for the use which their compositions might be put, but for the abuse. Lukacs had an accusing view of both Nietzsche and Wagner, Wag, uh, Wagner, wait, Wagner, yeah, sorry. Um, concomitantly, he asserted that not a single bar of Mozart could ever be harnessed to inhumane purpose. And then he said, the point is finally taken. It is true of the second area of a queen of the night in the magic flute. Um, or is it true of the second area of the queen of the night in the magic flute? Well, look and, at Clockwork Orange. I mean, that's Beethoven. But, then, you know, 
would he make that argument? I, it's, it's bizarre. And I, I, you know, the meaning of a work which evolves as language and symbols take on new dimensions, how can an artist in that milieu have any responsibility for the development of culture in the future? I, I, that just strikes me as so, what is he saying? I mean, does he mean his, the actual artist's intent or the physical created, you know, art object? That's, this is like, that. Yeah, look, look at the Sermon on the Mount, which uh, far right Republicans use for every possible in, 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 in nefarious purpose. I don't, think, I don't think there's any sentence that you could write that would be immune to being appropriated by some evil person for something. Anyway. You know, when it comes to the whole bad egg messing things up, that's a variable that we don't necessarily have to look at as, well, that just ruins everything. What we can say is, okay, what happened in the past? How can we learn from that? How can we create stop gaps? Um, so an example I was you know, mentioning was you know, the stock market crashing during the Great Depression. Well, that had never happened. So what they did is said, okay, so we're gonna stop the market if that happens again. You know, so when you see a problem, then the think tank, then the groups can say, okay, how do we stop that from happening again? So instead of just saying, okay, well, this is a problem. It's like, okay, we, evolution isn't just a physical thing. Right, right, right. It's That's exciting. Good point. How do we change it as we grow? You know? So you're saying, so, you you're know. saying like, like be precise about it and just and deal with a proximal cause of the problem instead of rewriting your your theory of human nature and, and, and coming up with a, with a kind of a sour metaphysic and then everything goes downhill. Yeah, it's, it's like people saying, well, Marxism didn't work because see what happened. It's like, no, that was one experiment of it. So you see what went wrong. You look at the right parts and you see, okay, how can we reimagine this and, you know, and fix it? And, and wherever it does work, it's, it's, it's not called that. So like healthcare, right. minimum wage, decent roads, all those. That's not Marxism. That's the that's the Republicans being smart and helpful. No, no, no. Your grandparents actually died fighting the police for stuff like that. Oh, oh. Yeah. I think you'd also, Scott. I want to give you a plug for. Um, I think I think you you go into a, quite a nice rant about uh, providing the the base substrate for for children growing up in, in the most optimal environment and look what we can, uh, you know, look, look what will flourish from, from, uh, from children growing up in a, a, a help, a, ha a happy, well-adjusted environment. So, you know, and a creative administration in the U.S. could do something like that. Just look. So I went to a mostly Jewish high school, and we would go to kibbutzim during uh, the summers to come back with our little gumba bracelets and stuff like that. But what if you like required high school kids to go to like, Norway and uh, Sweden, and then like interact with children that are raised over there. They're like aliens. I mean, if, if you took like your average Texan and, and, and flew them over to Northern Europe and interacted with these like, like totally super humane, rational people, it just changes your sense of what's possible with human it's, behavior. It's, it's, it's ideal. There's, the problem is Schrodinger, that when you go to observe them, you're gonna disturb them. I mean, if we did this in mass, Oh shit! So it has to be. You have to like. You're right. And but, but I totally agree with what Mark is saying. If your strategies in cultural development recognize the past, then nothing you're going to do now was predictable as something in the past. It's an entirely new situation. You have the knowledge of the past and the things that failed. You never had that before, and you're going to go forward now in a different way. You know, yeah, you've but, been inoculated. Well, Physically, so my, so my, my concern is d deeper than that. It really is because when you have a society that's already been built up, and it's the structure for generations is based on the equation of power, then it's very difficult to move against that because you only got so much manpower to move against a system that got so many checks about uh, not allowing you to invade into a system. Uh, we're seeing this in the United States right now, you know? So therefore, in a sense, you know, like even that, a, a, at best you could do it incrementally because the, <laughs> like, like they just pass a law, you know, like, no, what, what the Republicans are doing here, what, 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 tampering with the voter thing, uh, that's good, that's okay. I mean, it's like, really? So you can't even go out there and vote? <laughs> 
the way you want to, in a way. So in a sense, because they have the power to stop you. So I mean, does it really finally come down to the fact that, you know, just every side go get a gun and fight for it? And therefore, in a sense, then you just say, well, we finally defeated them. But then you become like them, you know, it's, it's a problem. That's why, you know, that's why I made the comment, you know, give it another few more years of hot summers and tornadoes and everything else. And they'll finally realize that, well, maybe there's something wrong with this, you know. I, I think the thing is, and this is a, a real generalization, so I'm not saying I'm, I'm accurate here necessarily, but it, it seems like that, you know, you want to talk Democrats, Republicans, Democrats tend to lean towards being passive because there's a reasonability. So, oh, let's talk about it. Let's think about it versus just act, push, you know, be aggressive, less thinking. And um, I would say that you're right there. It is extremely challenging, but just because something's difficult, it doesn't mean it's impossible. It just means you yeah. will have to work harder to do it. And, you know, you want to talk about, um, I, I, we just brought up an example not that long ago about, you know, if you do this cultural exchange and you go and you, and you say, okay, you know, this will totally change everyone's perspective to, to go into a totally different alien type of, of situation and, and learn from it. And, and one of the comments made was, well, what if you disturb that other culture, you know, you're now a bad influence on them. And my argument would be the same way um, when it comes to free will. Uh, at a certain point, if, if you have faith in the way that you've raised your kids, you're not worried about them being around bad influences from time to time because you trust their judgment. So if, if you raise uh, a culture, and, and that's, you know, it's like a, a greater version of that to have certain values. Um, I mean, look at Germany right now. Uh, they have learned from Hitler's time. They're, they're, for the most part, I mean, there is a lot of, um, you know, repentance and, and people. I mean, they have parts that are just, they won't build on them because atrocities were created there. Cultures can change. And I think what's important is for people um that are on the you know I, I hate to say good side but you know on the more um rare tolerant and wanting to do something about it side um like the gandhi side you know like i'm i'm one person but i can do what the odds say i can't do um it's even more important for them to act uh and, and do something because we know that the other side is going to keep acting so it, it, something that's right. That's right. Yeah. People on the left need, need to stop being such. So it's it's okay. Never mind. Just forget what I said. All I right. Want to, I want to bring up something about um, what what Scott said about the idea of sending somebody in like an exchange to to the northern parts of Europe. Right. So great idea. Valid points. Everybody's saying. Imagine changing that and putting the exchange and sending the the American, Canadian, whatever uh, kids to North Korea. The, the same output does it. I mean, it's like, oh no, we might ruin their. Oh, culture. Yeah, that's good. That, that's right. They they can take both ends, both ends of the of the spectrum. That's right. So you, yeah. I mean, would they see the value? Would they appreciate? It's because they see the. This is what my my um you know my my father had told me. But what, you know, you never regret traveling or seeing other cultures. You see other cultures is just like education. Yeah. You know so. You know, maybe we're ambassadors to go out and travel, bring it back, and you know, maybe that's where I don't know. Just no, it's it's a great idea, and the other thing it, is it helps us not to take things for granted because you know, in America, we're pretty spoiled here without even realizing it for the most part. And when you know, you that whole stereotype, well, you come back home and you kiss the sand type of thing. Um, it's not a matter of being better in any way. It's just that there are options. There are, you know, there are programs, there, there are things here. And um, I don't remember the, the reference to this, so I apologize. But there was some culture that I learned about where they basically banned art. You know, it was just kind of, or, or most kinds of art. 
Um, and it was like the underground was like artists. It wasn't like they were smuggling drugs. They were like, you know, and, and I think there's something about valuing what you have and not just kind of saying, oh, okay, you know, whatever, that that cultural exchange would not only let you learn about someone else, but it would also say, okay, what are some things that they don't have that we should re really um, utilize more instead of just kind of yeah. it being there? And, and, and the things that they worship and value, that's the most interesting thing about traveling. Like stuff that we take for granted is, is nothing like, you know, when, when, when Europeans brought glass beads and baubles to the to these non-Europeans and they realized, oh, my God, we can get gold for like Coke bottles and stuff like this. It's just a, it's just a shock to, uh, to experience other other values. I think that's the I think that's that's the most interesting thing is um, why do they care about these things? Like, like when art is suppressed, suddenly art becomes like feverishly important and you're meeting with friends, risking your lives, risk, risking arrest, having secret meetings. And it, it, it just, uh, you need to see different forms of repression and, um, and domination in order to see different well, well, counter reactions by these, the, by the saplings that are trying to break through it. Well, wait a minute. Could I, ask, uh, could, I, could I ask you a question, Daniel, uh, going back a couple of conversations? Yeah. Daniel, you're not planning on going to North Korea by chance, are you? <laughs> no, but I, I was there, I was there, or I was in the demilitarized zone, actually. So I made it close. I, I could see I could see the guards, and I could see all the wildlife in the in the area where where they're you know they will they would have planted the um, you know the the landmines and stuff. What 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 year did you do that? Well, it must have been ten years ago. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, you know, I'm from South Korea, so the uh, issue of North Korea is pretty upsetting. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I was no going to go see the route. I'm sorry. I was, to, I was going to bring it back to this traveling thing, but e even in that situation, you have to have a how should I say a, a an environment that allows you to do that. I mean, if you run into something like Nazi Germany, what actually defeated them? Was it being nice to them, or was it finally that you had to go in there with a lot of guns? And we almost lost in spite of that, you know? It's like at some about, point, at some yeah. point, the structures become too powerful for you to say, hey, let, hey let's just be nice, you know? No, well, no, we, they don't we, want to we, be nice. we weren't talking about dominating them. We were talking about learning from them, coming back home and using that knowledge, the way Wallace examined this culture, came home. I, no, I understand. But, but what I'm saying is that when, you, when you're in an extreme situation, uh, the structure is so frozen that it's difficult to do it because they will they will fight to the death to keep what they have and they did fight to the death right yeah that's right that's right. Yeah. Death, somebody else's death yes yeah, sometimes the, the better argument uh, doesn't matter and the, the, the people will not voluntarily lose power you have to you have to threaten them but l let me show these two videos because we're right on this topic now and, and these videos are only 30 seconds long so these will be like little little dinner mints for you guys here we go <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Wallace is as acute an observer of men as of nature. In an age in which Victorians called the people of the Amazon savages, he has a rare sympathy with their culture. He understands what language, what invention, what custom means to them. He's perhaps the first person to seize the fact that the distance between that civilization and ours is much shorter than we think. It's lovely. Natural selection could only have endowed savage man with a brain a few degrees superior to that of an ape, whereas he actually possesses one very little inferior to that of a philosopher. With our advent, there had come into existence a being in whom the subtle force we term mind became of far more importance than mere bodily structure. Was that, that, was, that was your clip, wasn't it, Scott? Yeah, I, just, I thought those were cute little things, but, and they were short, and I just threw them in there, but there's not, not much to say about those, except it, it's it, that Trading Places, the movie Trading Places is an important film. Remember Eddie Murphy? Eddie Murphy became Dan Aykroyd, and Dan Aykroyd became 
was even worse than Eddie Murphy. Remember when he lost all his money? He was the drunk Santa Claus. So uh, it's it's not it's not a long distance from um, from a Biff to Wolf Boy. All it takes it, it, it's a it's a cultural difference. And uh, geez, I mean, any anyone could be a Wolf Boy if you raise them in the right environment. So uh, it was Pygmalion all over again. Well, yeah, you know, I was right here in Philadelphia that Eddie Murphy did that. So yeah. Yeah, very empathetic to that question. I think it's really foreshadowing here that he's saying how close the mental capabilities of these humans are to the Europeans at the time that he realized we can't make a differentiation here. Yeah. But, but that, that sort of, I think he's going to use that to talk about the genetic differences when he talks about genetic, you know, separation. Uh, that's a foreshadowing, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, here's the last clip on this uh, love of the healthy savage. And this is the most beautiful one. This is, his, this is Wallace's poem. There is an Indian village. All around the dark, eternal, boundless forest spreads its varied foliage. Here I dwelt a while, the one white man among perhaps 200 living souls. Each day, some labor calls them. Now they go to fell the forest pride, or in canoe, with hook and spear and arrow to catch fish. A palm tree's spreading leaves supply a thatch, impervious to the winter's storms and rain. The women dig the mandioca root and with much labor make of it their bread. And all each morn and eve wash in the stream and sport like mermaids in the sparkling wave. The children of small growth are naked and the boys and men wear but a narrow cloth. How I delight to see those naked boys their well-formed limbs, their bright, smooth, red-brown skin, and every motion full of grace and health. And as they run and race and shout and leap, or swim and dive beneath a rapid stream, I pity English boys, their active limbs cramped and confined in tightly fitting clothes. But how much more I pity English maids, their waist and chest and bosom all confined, by that vile, torturing instrument called stays. I'd be an Indian here and live content to fish and hunt and paddle my canoe and see my children grow like young wild fawns in health of body and in peace of mind rich without wealth and happy without gold wow all right i, I actually that? i actually uh admire him for doing that because i tell you because because i value knowledge so much i wouldn't want to stay there forever for sure right and I wonder whether that's not a kind of funny nostalgia, wishing for something you've already lost, rather than the fact, you know, I, I think I think what what he should have said is that we should be more tolerant of others and let them be as much as we can, in spite of the fact that we're different, rather than creating essentially a monoculture in which, you know, everything has to become our servants in some form, whether it's our economy or something else. I think that would be more fair because once you have that, then in a sense you could uh, go and visit them, no problem, you know, and you could go back to your study of geometry or whatever you want to study, and that's okay because that, that itself is okay without, in a sense, suddenly abandon it to a kind of nostalgia. You know, you, you unfortunately you were born too late to have experienced this, you know, like, you know, 
the nostalgia for the thing that you never had a chance to be, rather than just let the people be what they are already, because they're fine, and let them slowly choose whatever they want to be. I mean, maybe, that, he's, that's he's my thought. He's, he feels sorry for the English. And he, said, right. he, he mentioned the children, but um, he's apparently also thinking of the adults. I think he's making this, a, a as an anthropologist, he's saying, look at this human living and look at our human living and look at the degradation of what we've done and how, you know, I go to London and it's full of dirt and soot and poor starve. And it's like, here there's nobody suffering. He's looking at something that is wrong with his culture without saying it. He said, I, I think I would stay here. I, the gold, I, like, I'm not going to eat it. Look at them. They're eating the fish they caught yesterday. This contrast and a sort of neutral tone and anthropological remove, you know, but, and yet judging it and mentioning his own cultural as a con contrast. I think he's saying something really negative about his own culture. Oh yeah, so no, the, I, the leaving it is is not a nostalgia as much as a deprecation of his the values that surround him. And he was what, a poor, poor man. But in his culture, you have uh, um, affordable chinaware, and you have um, iron bed frames, and you have cotton underwear, and you have soap, and and it, it's true that on this island. There's something wrong, right? They're missing an, a, a, an organization of human power and also, you know, ownership and coercion, which does produce this this, this mushroom explosion of little of amazing little use values. But on the other hand, it produces all sorts of, of misery and sickness and, and madness. And and there's something artificial about working underground in a factory when you're a child. I mean, imagine what one of those little machine working coal kids would be like mentally. I mean, just imagine placing one of these kids playing in the water side by side with a Charles Dickens kid and just watching them stand there. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you you notice many many different things. Like the like the white kid would probably, would be, have, probably have ticks, right? He have little little animals in his hair and probably have brain damage from all the, the gas, the coal fumes and everything. It's just it's such a vast contrast. But I understand what, what Phil is saying. I went to India for a year, and I was I was hanging around with like hash heads and meditators and i thought i gotta get the hell out of here i thought my brain was going to turn into into mush i was like i need to go back i need to go to grad school i need to, to my, put myself through difficulty to keep myself sharp i have my mom send me a physics book and the phenomenology of spirit just so i could have something hard to read because then i want to become one of these stoners um but terrence mckenna came up with a solution to this and this was his vision like 25 years ago he says in the future we will all be back in the serengeti wearing loincloths running through the plains <laughs> in, the, in the environment, but we will have contact lenses that have Wi-Fi so that we can download every painting, every movie, every book. So our mind will be in its perfect utopia of information where everything, every even like, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright's blueprints, everything is downloadable into your contact lens. You can read it, but your body is in the place where it needs to be. I thought that was a great idea. Yeah, I think it really is the best of both worlds. You know, one of the points I was going to make, which kind of combined with these were um, about Phil, about your, your comment before about, um, you know, when things get out of hand, you know, like the Nazis, you know, you have to take action. And I think there's a difference between being proactive and reactive. And when you don't have to be reactive and you can be proactive, these cultural exchanges um, are so valuable because people fear the unknown and exposing people. Like if that was part of the curriculum, if we got to a generation where there actually was, you know, Hey, you're going to spend this semester visiting these three different cultures. Um, I mean, th there's a, a gentleman. Uh, uh, and the only reason I mentioned the race is because you you'll understand in a minute. Uh, African American, um, uh, uh, Daryl Davis. Maybe you guys have heard of him, but he goes to KKK members and speaks to them and gets to know them, and they like him. A and he's actually gotten a few of them to stop being KKK members because they went from a place of ignorance to, you know, I mean, this is a very brave person and a very patient person to go into you know, hate-filled environments, and that's obviously a pretty extreme um, situation. 
but you know you want to talk about the problems you know in, in america in particular but kind of in most places where, where it comes to either nationalism racism whatever you want to call some sort of intolerance or superiority if there was this cultural exchange um not only would that be extremely beneficial but um as in that example that we just you know heard about like the contact lenses that's just, that's such a beautiful um kind of way to think about you know yeah, the, the best of both worlds. What can we take to be free and not restricted? But then what can we also, you know, do? And and one argument I would also make, and this is, you know, maybe an individual thing because I kind of am maybe like a, a, a non-practicing transcendentalist where I, I'm real into nature. I'm real into being in isolation and Emerson and Thoreau and all that stuff. And so to me, you know, being in, in a culture, you know, like in the video, it's like, it's not necessarily limiting me from knowledge. It's giving me a chance to innovate. It's giving me the peace and clarity so that I can come up with, um, you know, from my own imagination, new premises. Um, that doesn't mean that I can't have a collection of books or say, you know what, for the next month, I need a break and I'm going to go learn what I've missed in culture. But, um, you know, it really is what you take to it. That's an excellent point. Yeah, being able to write well or do your art well, more than utensils and, and having good Wi-Fi speed, it's having good social relations and having a nice forest to walk through. Like, um, like I'm, I'm interviewing two professors now for, for a series. It's taken me a long time to edit these videos because I'm blowing my nose and saying stupid stuff. But both of them, uh, two things that you said, they just said this last week. First is they need to put their bodies in a, a spacious environment and just let, let their eyes move I, I, there's something about distance where you just kind of go out and you just you become as expansive as a space that you can see i guess so in some way you identify with your perceptual contents so they, they're running around the forest all the time in order to write they're doing it because it, it makes them better writing machines so for the machine to, to be healthy you need to feed it this loincloth outdoors stuff and the other thing is this kkk guy both of these professors said the same thing i was like because there's that viral video you've seen it there's a black guy with a white power t-shirt and he wants to kill a Vietnam vet who has an Antifa sign. And the sign says this offensive thing. Antifa loves you. So there's a black guy over there and he's embodied this fantasy of being like a super testosterone. And he, he takes his knife out and he cuts the sign and he's saying, please hit me, please hit me because I want to kill you to the old scared Vietnam vet guy. And the police are laughing, of course, because he's white, white, white power. If you're black, have a white power shirt, you're safe. You're not going to be uh, shot at the police. So I was asking uh, these uh, Steve Tobinak and Robert Hand. I was like, what do you do now? What are you going to do with the black guy with the white power shirt who's, who's trying to kill uh, um, hippies and progressives because whatever fantasy he's on? And the answer was what um, uh, Malcolm was just saying, which is something like, don't approach them as a know-it-all. Don't make them feel wrong from the get-go, which liberals sometimes do because they have the high ground and, it, and it, you, they reek of it. Be an equal and begin. In, in a way, you have to do this kind of trip. It's like an inception type compromise move where you have to actually reflect and mirror and, and validate all the strange, crazy, poisonous shit that they're into. And then suddenly, tiny link, tiny link, more links, more links, and then you can make change. So it's this very slow, painful method. But it, it, it sounds crazy, but I can't think of anything better. I want to add to that, Scott. I, I know there's uh, some, uh, by some people are put under, thrown, he's thrown under the bus as kind of a pseudo intellectual. It's Jordan Peterson. I'll bring him up. I say he's got a lot of courage. And I do see that he will bring people onto his show and he will attempt to open up conversations with people. I saw him in an interview with somebody that was uh, somebody on the far right. And, um, I, I almost felt that he was going through that same mental pain, trying to understand what this guy was all about. But he, you know, he's also a psychologist. So in order to break new ground and to um, expose people in a genuine helping way, I guess that's therapeutic for everybody, you have to give some sort of validation, right? Um, and you know, I, I, I think, I think, I think Tubman X right in that case. And I think you're bang on. And, uh, I wish there was more tolerance for people understanding and trying to, um, understand people's perspectives. 
Yeah. yeah. You know, listening to someone who contradicts you is the way you learn something new. And being open to that means not being prideful about your position and opening up your expanse to saying, I'm ignorant of like a lot of stuff, you know, show me the dark matter or whatever. And because, uh, <clears throat> you know, the person is asserting from a core, an honest core, which you haven't had revealed to you because their experience is not your experience and their framing is not your framing. So this is, and this is, and what I'm giving you now is just pure con. It's like, you got to listen to the guy. That's your obligation. Yeah. And let me add a, a little raw to that cop by saying, if you had that same DNA and you were raised by the same parents in the same neighborhood, not only would you be that guy, you are that guy. Who, who's that, Rawls? Is that Rawls? Is yeah, yeah, sure. Isn't that Rawls? Okay. Well, I know that that is something that uh, uh, Sam Harris has definitely said that. I mean, I know it's not, he didn't originate it, but yeah, maybe it was Rawls. But didn't Rawls do the veil of ignorance as well? That's right. Rawls says you could have been born black, handicapped, Down syndrome, poor. Therefore, Very don't punish white. people that are black, handicapped, uh, Down syndrome, and poor. Give them some minimal human decency. Remember the last episode about energy and the industrial revolution? All these original innovators, they believe that there, were, there was a basis of human decency, but now the Republicans have turned the desire to have super poor black people into like a good, because it makes poor white people feel better about themselves. So you get this Willie Horton stuff, the <laughs> welfare moms and the anti-welfare, anti-healthcare madness that the Republicans have done to trick poor white people. Uh, Guys, the we're not going to get a lot of Republicans tuning into this channel if we keep, you know, <laughs> using the Republicans as the butt of everything. Okay, I'm just okay. warning you. You may know that already. I'm just kidding. Okay, sorry. <laughs> well, well, I guess I, I guess marketing is important these days. So, what synonym should we use for Republican? What should what should, what should we call them? We can't use conservatives because not Chomsky is a conservative. Evil and I don't know. Evil. Okay, evil. That's it. David. Okay. Down, David. Down, David. Yeah, what it should be is tricked by their own people. I'm sure there's a more concise way to say that, but yeah. that yeah. might help them. I, it's true though. Okay, so I'm from New York originally. I remember walking through and seeing, um, you know, you know, they have stands, they sell jewelry and all sorts of stuff. They had all these pins now, and they were all liberal and you know whatever. Now I agreed with almost everything. I, I think I, I agreed with everything that was on every pin. And I'm thinking, whose mind are you going to change with this? Mm -hmm. so, uh, all your you're not starting a conversation. You're not opening minds, you know, because it's just we're good, you're bad, we're right, you're wrong. It's so confrontational and so in your face. And I think, um, you know, the news doesn't help, obviously. Um, you know, I, I, I know people that are, um, you know, where I, I have a, a friend that's a couple where they happen to be Republicans and I would say misguided you know, kind hearted, but confused, however you want to say it in the nicest way possible. And the wife is willing to hear out the other side and the husband just won't hear it at all. And so I think the conversation does need to be opened up uh, where people feel comfortable uh, because uh, how else are you going to change? Well, I, I was trying to say that a little obliquely that we're not going to change because we're going to mostly all agree we're not going to get any dissenting opinions on this very open discussion because uh, it's going to be alienating to people. With, I'm just, how will we ever hear the voice that we'd never hear in our own head? Wait, I could say that I did hear that voice when I was younger. I grew up in Alberta. I was um, focused as being a, a businessman. Um, I was a conservative, I guess, like a young conservative, I guess. Um, I would watch Rush Limbaugh, so we know where that, who, you know, what kind of side of the aisle that guy's on. And uh, that was my mentality when I, you know, when I was, uh, you know, kind of undergrad age, right? And earlier, high school, this kind of thing. It's all about trying to go out. How do you make a business? How do you be successful? And it, I think the perspective is that. Um, and I'm not saying that the state of the conservative mentality hasn't changed. It hasn't, the old boys club hasn't turned in, into something that's 
toxic now or anything like that. I'm not saying that, but the fundamental of a young person trying to say, hey, wait a minute, let's not look at all of this whole spectrum of conversation. Let's just focus on trying to do this. Let's not make the, the, the spectrum of the conversation from, from A to Z. Let's just go and get our job done, you guys. Stop talking about all this stuff that doesn't matter. Let's go and get your job done. <laughs> like, you know, the plurality doesn't solve the problem. The bridge still needs to get built. Okay, now I'm not having, I'm just saying that there, there is a, there, there's a way of thought that I think I can fall into with that group that I can understand because I thought that way. Mm. All right, well, let's, I, I, there's oh. nothing more, more pleasant than uh, ruining a good, lively, and timely conversation by getting back on track to the video. So yeah. I'm going to pick the most painful way back in. Here we go. <laughs> Alfred Wallace returned from the tropics, as Darwin had done, convinced that related species diverge from a common stock and nonplussed as to why they diverged. What Wallace did not know was that Darwin had hit on the explanation two years after he returned to England. Darwin recounts that in 1838, he was reading the essay on population by the Reverend Thomas Malthus. For amusement, says Darwin, meaning it was not part of his serious reading. And he was struck by a thought in Malthus. Malthus had said that population multiplies faster than food. If that's true of animals, then they must compete to survive. So that nature acts as a selective force, killing off the weak and forming new species from the survivors who are fitted to their environment. Here I had at last got a theory by which to work, says Darwin. And you think that a man who said that would set to work, write papers, go out and lecture? Nothing of the kind. For four years, Darwin did not even commit the theory to paper. Only in 1842, he wrote a draft of 35 pages in pencil. And two years later, he expanded it to 230 pages in ink. And that draft, he deposited with a sum of money and instructions to his wife to publish it if he died. We feel that Darwin would really have liked to die before he published the theory, provided after his death the priority should come to him. That's a strange character. It speaks for a man who knew that he was saying something deeply shocking to the public certainly deeply shocking to his wife, and who was himself, to some extent, shocked by it. That's nice. Yeah, people attack Darwin for being anti-dignity of the human. You're making humans into, into animals, and you're saying we came from the mud, which makes us disqualified from being good, important, and all this. But imagine, how did Darwin, did he have something like that? Was he saddened by the naturalness of our foundation is being molded by Prometheus out of mud and blown into by Elohim that important just like self-concept how, how would he reconcile the divine question if he's about to show you that it's just all slime that's grown into us how does he reconcile that one he you know you need bigger minds I think no, I, I, I think his decision was, was uh, cultural. I mean, he knew what happened to Galileo, you know? And uh, when you have something that's so shocking, uh, in, in fact, more shocking than Galileo, because even he had, had trouble reconciling that, it's best that you just produce it and, uh, and, and, and let I love that happen well, after you're dead. Well, they can't kill you again. Maybe he could dig you up in the grave and chop you up, I suppose. But so I, I think, I think that's a problem with, with with any culture that's sort of like not open enough to accept a different opinion. 
but he knew how shocking it would be, you know. I think he, he did know how shocking it was be, be but the, the the difference with Galileo is I don't I think it was it, it was his culture you're right absolutely Phil but I don't think he was fearful of his life I think he was he cherished his wife and the life and the religiosity and the the I mean you know it, I think he it would have been devastating to her and to a lot of people in his community and he just didn't want to be the, you know, the the pallbearer of of, uh, you, you know, the, the the death of a culture, you know. Right. Yeah, but mentioned that his wife was very devout. Yeah. Yes. So, so here's the companion piece that contrasts uh, Wallace to uh, Darwin. The hypochondria. Yes, he had some infection from the tropics. The bottles of medicine. The enclosed somewhat suffocating atmosphere of his house and study, the afternoon naps, the delay in writing, the refusal to argue in public, all those speak for a mind that did not want to face the public. The younger Wallace, of course, was held by none of these inhibitions. Brashly he went off in spite of all adversities to the Far East, and there on a night of fever he recalled the same book by Malthus, and had the same explanation flash on him that had struck Darwin. Yeah, but but haven't they both discovered? I, I mentioned this before that if it becomes a food as a shortage of food, then in a sense it it it, it becomes one of struggle, and I think. Yeah, he, he wasn't afraid like Galileo was of being tortured in the rack. But nonetheless, he knew that the culture was so much a, 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 a cultural power that was difficult to struggle with it. It's better, better to inter, introduce it when they're not absent to strangle you culturally or whatever. So it's the same thing. It's something I'm telling, uh, I'm asserting that sometimes the culture could become so static and powerful that it's hard to work against it. You know, that's that's the lesson I got from it because even his basis of evolution is that in a sense the powerful exists. That is a more powerful force than goodness in a sense because you know like when it comes right down to it's me or you for this last, last loaf of bread, you know, like I suppose if you're very generous say, well, I'll just give you half. You know, whatever. But if it's the last, uh, if it's the last uh, slice, you know, you could say, uh, you know, it take a very generous man to say, uh, here you take it. I could do without it. You know what I mean? So, so therefore, goodness almost uh, is necessary in a culture that has enough to share. Number one and number two were. Just sharing is enough without hoarding uh, from others and preventing them for what, because you're so scared about what will happen next year, you know? And we all are, you know? Like, we've been taught to, to save for our old age and retirement on the whole bit, you know? Like, because we know the day will come when, you know, when you're, when you no longer can work and therefore you got to have something to protect you. So it almost seems like, being good to each other in, in that sense, if the foundation is that requires you to have a, a plenty enough that at least ordinary people don't end up fighting against either. You could be an extraordinary person and you know and you don't care about dying, just give it to the others. But that 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 that's asking a lot. All right. Uh any remarks on that? Because I, I, I wanted to play the video where Wallace writes down his experience of, of realizing what, what was going on in from his journal. But go ahead. Yeah, Dave? Yeah, um, it's hard to characterize what Darwin is doing. I think there are a lot of dimensions. I'm not sure it, if he believes in the importance of this information. If he was had a commitment to science, he would be doing something else than hiding it in a drawer with a lot of money to publish later. So why is he deferring this knowledge to later? If it's so damaging to society, why is he going to publish it? So he's 
just seems to me, right, he's acting out of fear. This is a cowardice. Is he protecting something of value? I mean, I really have trouble putting any good spin on this. Uh, he's taking his wife from some embarrassment in their family, but she has to publish it when he dies. Yeah. Eh, I don't know how I see this. That's interesting. Yeah, maybe there's been some later research on this to solve the mystery of why he hid it. Yeah, it's an interesting. But there, it's interesting. It's a fun problem. I've got the answer, but I'm going to write in a little secret capsule. Oh, somebody else discovers the answer. Uh, what do we do about it? who? Are, who's the discoverer? Okay. Yeah, who gets credit? Yeah. Yeah, what's this? Yeah. Hmm. So, so I, I'd like to play this video. This is the first formulation. This got me kind of excited because it reminded me that night Heisenberg came up with this matrix mechanics. Remember the story? He's in the mountains with his girlfriend. He's drunk. He just had an orgasm. And then suddenly he sees it in his head and he scribbles it down. So this uh, this reminds me of that moment. Let me get this up here. This is. That was a brief but shocking story, Scott. All right. Okay, here we go. It occurred to me to ask the question, why do some die and some live? The answer was suddenly clear. From the effects of disease, the most healthy escaped. From enemies, the strongest, the swiftest, or the most cunning. From famine, the best hunters, or those with the best digestion. Then I at once saw that the ever-present variability of all living things would furnish the material from which by the mere weeding out of those less adapted to the actual conditions, the fittest alone would continue the race. I thought it over, the more I became convinced that I had at length found the long sought for law of nature that solved the problem of the origin of species. I waited anxiously for the termination of my fit so that I might at once make notes for a paper on the subject. The same evening I did this pretty fully and on the two succeeding evenings wrote it out carefully in order to send it to Darwin by the next post, which would leave in a day or two. What was the part of the theory that was the, the biggest, uh, the hardest part to conceive? And that is what took it so long to, to become articulated. Like, with this, what's the thing in there that's so novel that it's mind blowing and requires something like a paradigm shift? And I wonder if it's the idea that variation is something like a material, like the cloth that you're cutting these things from is pure variation. Because normally we don't think of variation as being like, a generator, like a, a, a stuff generator. But in fact, that's the case. The stuff is at the point, what it is, is the rearrangement of the genetic material that provides many different flowers from which selection can punish the uh, the, inferior, the the insufficiently reproducing. <laughs> Maybe, so that was the idea. Like, you know, it's, 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 these are uh, counterintuitive and unnatural thoughts that variation is a provider. You guys are stunned by that. Well, well, yeah, it's an entirely additional dimension beyond what Malthus was offering. There's no variation question in that. It's about reproducing more and more and more. But the question of variation as a force in that, because you're going to be pruning the result and seeing that as a statistical force on the group. Oh, That's right. And, and maybe thinking... Well, the one the, the Beatles with the longer horns will have children with that longer horns. So maybe he thought that through because I think they, they did think in that way. They knew about breeding. So it's really putting several things together about the variation, survival, and the repetition. I think it all has to be there, right? Right. To, yeah, see, both. The species <laughs> diverge, to see the divergence of the species. That's right. Yeah, there's a pruning process, but that's not good enough. You also have to have... A, uh, a, 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 a spring of material that you can prune from. And uh, so I was wondering if that idea of a spring of, of, of randomness as, um, as 
creativity or randomness as mother for novelty. Yeah, that's it. It was, it was just a thought about it. It was, you know, like process metaphysics is uncomfortable to think about because we, we, our language demands that substances be like things. So these are, these are just different, different types of thinking that are unnatural. It, well, you know. we, we have that in brain science to a certain degree. We know that when children are young, uh, the neural connections are growing like, you know, like sprouting all over the place. You know, it's fantastic. It's developing everywhere. But by the time, I don't know whether it's six or, you know, or 10 or whatever, uh, they begin to prune back certain things because they already value certain structures already that in a sense outweigh this uh, pure explosion of possibilities. You have to prune it back. So, so there's a kind of a middle ground in which the form begin to take over it as well as the, the growth of extension of possibilities. And I think if you are, you, if you had a brain, <laughs> it would be functional, the size of a football field. I suppose it could continue to grow a lot more before you prune it back. But in fact, we don't. We have a limitation. So therefore, you always have to deal with the unlimited in, in a limited structure. So you have to make certain sacrifices and certain trade-offs. Maybe I shouldn't say sacrifice. Certain trade-off for one thing versus another thing. That's not to say that I think that both things are important, but at some point it just doesn't fit. You have to you have to prune back. I mean, even if you collect records, at some point, you know, you just don't have enough room <laughs> to do it. So you have to like sort it out and say, no, this one I really like, I gotta keep this one rather than collect more and more. I remember I got so many records at some point I actually had to like categorize them because I couldn't find them, right? And then I found out there was a guy who had fifteen thousand. I said, "Oh my God, <laughs> you know, how could you even listen to it?" You so, just have to remember where they all are. That's the well, yeah, you don't yeah, yeah. Have time well, to listen to fifteen thousand for heaven's sakes. Let alone yeah. uh, listen to it again. <laughs> That's depressing. You know, when I was young, I was really I was like way about sex, I guess. And then when, when I read about Wilt Chamberlain and Gene Simmons, I was like, what's the point? You know, what's the point? I just wanted to quit. All right, just, just kidding. All right, so here's the cutest part of the video. This is just, this is pure pleasure. So here's a little pastry for everyone to enjoy. This is just great. But one thing they all had in common. From that moment, it was no longer possible to believe any story which supposed that at any time, now there could be created once again the beginning of life. Most people believed that creation had not stopped with the Bible. They thought that the sun breeds crocodiles from the mud of the Nile. Mice were supposed to grow of themselves in heaps of dirty old clothes. And it was obvious that the origin of blue bottles is bad meat. Maggots must be created inside apples. How else did they get there? All these creatures were believed to come to life spontaneously without the benefit of parents. <laughs> what this is, is that? So, this what is a wonderful. Funny, it's like he sprung from the wine glass spontaneously, and we had to see the maggot <laughs> in the apple. It's amazing. I have a question. I, I actually think that was the best moment, really. It was. I, I loved that moment too. That was a good yeah. one. The wine it, moment. Well, yeah, no. Well, what the, came out of it? I mean, he he started with something that seemed non sequitur, but he'll explain. And I think that that <laughs> part was really wow. important very important yeah it's what comes it, it's what comes and how he explains the wine is, is wine. Very... yeah do you do what it was his point you can't believe any story anymore that there can be a creation once again of the beginning of life uh, was he just trying to say 
We're throwing out Genesis. Is that what you're trying to say? It, it couldn't happen all at once. Was no, that what no. he meant to say? Or is he saying something else? No, he, to me, he's saying something that's very much like what an artist does. In, in other words, to see, to make visible which is previously invisible, to let it unfold into vision. Because if you don't know it, you don't see it, you don't sense it, you can't, you could imagine, you could imagine, but the imagination would be a synthesis of something that's sort of like uh, uh, not correct, okay? So therefore, in a sense, visibility uh, is important, and the moment of visibility that's important is when, it be, when the invisible becomes the visible. That, that was very, very important. So what's visible is the evolutionary story is now visible. No, the, the, the visibility was that these microbes, in a sense, previously unknown, was actually living and dying, and, and by their own actions, they're transforming the wine. Uh, because, you know, I, I don't know how they thought the wine were, you know, you just let it sit around and somehow it transforms itself. But in fact, there was something happening that was a process that was unknown. It was like, okay, okay, he's saying something more than just good wine. It's like, but, well, but the lesson yeah, was- yeah, Let's pull back before we get to the wine, because the wine, it was a little bit different, but the, the I, I mean, no, you're right, Phil, but it was, it, it, he brings in a subtle nuance to something else. To, to mm -hmm. focus on what, what David was saying is that there's a, yeah. you know, is this idea that the, the bugs would emerge out of the, the, the meat. Right, um, they mm -hmm. they um, they would come out of nothing ex nihilo. Right, they just appear, and and so um, what I think what you know David was kind of priming here is to, to ask a question of like, well, does, is this upsetting to the populace because it somehow churns up the idea of of um, religious correlation? Mm -hmm. And I think that's exactly what it does. Yeah. But it, it brings to culture, it brings in something new into culture that says how we've myelinated the explanation is what gets um, challenged, right? And so you have an individual or population that say, this is how the world makes sense, but it no longer makes sense that way. They, they can accept the proof slowly with compelling information but somehow their world doesn't kind of make sense because, you know, grandma taught me all the time that, you know, I got to watch this meat because, you know, those like little magic bugs will come out of it. If I don't do, you know, if I don't run around the block three times and, you know, bang the carpets with this, uh, oh. you know, kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. I have a good video for the, for, for the meat, but I, I should, oh, I should prepare that. But I, I just wanted to say that uh, Dave's David is, is pointing out a real ambiguity. I didn't quite get the Genesis thing either. He, he he could be saying one of two things. One, he's saying Genesis. Uh, uh, if you if we pretend that Genesis happened, then it's happening again and again according to folk wisdom because th these things are spontaneously ge uh, generating. And then if he's saying, well, Genesis is ridiculous, then he's saying these are also equally ridiculous. So so every uh, gener all generation ex nihilo is uh, is is ridiculous. I'm not sure how how that how that that. that I wasn't that. sure if he was saying that all at once by you know implying we can't take these stories. He's holding a big book. Looked like it might be a Bible. I yeah. mean, what's he saying? We can't believe is what book is there, right? Well, yeah, I, I think he is saying that. I, I, to me, it's it's more, deeper than the book. I mean, I actually contrasted the to uh, to the Egyptians, which, by the way, I love the Egyptians, but they really believed that magic was an important ingredient in in the world, right? The God make this, and the way you communicate with the gods was through magic. It wasn't through something else. And so therefore, in a sense, when you get rid of magic, we, we kind we kind of like magic, even in our secular way, we like magic. But to think that, you know, like maggots could appear out of nothing, I mean that I mean that is very mysterious. <laughs> Even though, right. so, so we're talking about maggots coming out of meat. So this is my favorite commercial. I don't know if you guys remember Finney and Rainbow Meat. It's a really good quality uh, uh, deli cold cut from the '70s. We used to love it in my house. Here's a commercial in case you forgot. Oh my God! 
Look, there's a rainbow on my beak. Oh no, not again. I guess we'll have to throw it out. No! Don't throw out that meat! <laughs> I'm Finian, and I put that rainbow there. I put a rainbow in every slice of Finian's brand rainbow meats. It's yucky. It looks like oil floating out a puddle. He's got a point, Finian. It doesn't seem right. Right? What's right got to do with it? It's a rainbow, isn't it? And rainbows are beautiful. And my meat is beautiful. And I'll tell you why. Because it's jam-packed with chemicals. Good, healthy chemicals. Chemicals that'll make you grow up to be big and strong. Have you ever seen a leprechaun as big as me before? No. No one, I'll tell you why. Those other little people, they wouldn't touch my meat. They said, Finian, rainbows belong in the sky, not on a cold cut. Well, I showed them. I showed them all. I've got all kinds of fine rainbow meats. There's ham and roast beef, turkey, bologna, a new kosher rainbow tongue. Remember, if it hasn't got a rainbow on it, it isn't Finian's. Keep eating, you two. Come on, or I'll smash you over the head with a shillelagh. Go on, eat. <laughs> That's a big ever. I've uh, never seen that ever before. Thank you, Scott. Have I. That, you've given me a gift. Yeah, we. I, I love Finian rainbow meats. All right, all right. So, uh, so here's here's Dan's video. This is the most romantic of all the clips. Uh. It's clear that we have to look for the evolutionary progress of life in a buildup of chemical molecules. <laughs> That buildup must begin from the materials that boiled on the earth at its birth. doesn't love a lot of flowing lava to start out creation right just before this clip he started he was explaining um he was explaining about the lack of oxygen and yeah. the awareness that we didn't need oxygen in order to have life and so that the the foundation of life on earth was really began with um an oxygenless environment and uh, okay, so quick quiz to the philosophers in the room. Who was the pre-Socratic philosopher th that thought fire was primordial? What was that? Fire, yeah. okay. Was there one? I mean, there was water and, you know, or, or was it just one of the elements? Anyways. Heraclitus. Um, Heraclitus, not fire. Yeah. Whoa, yay. Wow. I mean, really interesting, right? If, if you take it from that perspective, you have this, you know, um, molten life shaping, um, you know, substance that really, you know, forms us, life itself, right? And that's where they look to for life. So, you know, in a way, I can appreciate that perspective as being, you know, the, you know, the life forming substance. And uh, it just science clarifies it, clarifies the intuition of, you know, several thousand years, right? Well, I, I like this boil metaphor. Everyone knows that you couldn't have heterotrophs until the autotrophs secreted enough oxygen through their photosynthesis. Yeah, yeah. But but if you zoom out and you use the boil metaphor, you're like, holy shit, it's really true. Here's a planet, and it has oxygen trapped in its solid material. Right, and, then little ne and then little negentropic islands form thanks to the solar uh, energy gradient. And then they start boiling the oxygen out of the mat the solid matter. So it really is the 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 planet that that's a Gaia moment where it's secreting its own oxygen out of itself by by producing a 
a, a process to free the oxygen. And then, well, and then no, 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 that, no, no, that, I need to correct you on that. I need to correct you on that. It was it, it was this very very primitive life. Now I realize that maybe that all all, all this chemical stuff produce the fundamental elements that created life. But it was this primitive life, in a sense, you could, still see them. you could still You you can still see them. I forgot the name, but you can still see them in Australia. They look like rocks, but they were the one that produce oxygen, and that because there was life before that, but they they produce the oxygen. So in a sense, he didn't get into ecology. The life form itself transformed the planet so that other forms of life could exist. Isn't that what oh. Scott was saying? Yeah, that, yeah, that, that's what he was saying. Yeah, we all agree on that. Right, and, and the thing is, oxygen is just really volatile chemical. Yeah. One, you know, so freeing it up and having it combined to make oxygen in the molecular form is it like an energy source for these critters, right? They're using that. It's a way to get a whole ton of energy out of the chemical you're made out of, right? All right. Here, here's that. Here's the, the final clip. This is the little clip about the gas conversion. To talk sensibly about the beginning of life, we have to be very realistic. We have to ask a historical question. For thousand million years ago, before life began, when the earth was very young, what was the surface of the earth, what was its atmosphere like? Well, it was like a volcanic neighborhood anywhere, a cauldron of steam and ammonia and gases. What gases? One gas was absent. There was no free oxygen. That's crucial because oxygen is produced by the plants and did not exist before life existed in a free state. These gases in their reducing atmosphere dissolved weakly in the oceans. How would they react now under the action of lightning electric discharges, under the action of ultraviolet light, which is very important in every theory of life and which could penetrate in the absence of oxygen. That question was answered by a beautiful experiment by Stanley Miller in America around about 1950. He put the atmosphere in a flask, the methane, the hydrogen cyanide, the ammonia, the water, the oxides of carbon, and went on for day after day after day, boiled and bubbled them up, put an electric discharge through them to simulate lightning and other violent forces. And visibly the mixture darkened. Why? because on testing it was found that amino acids had been formed in it. That's a crucial step forward, because amino acids are the building blocks of life. From them the proteins are made, and proteins are the constituents of all living things. So is that the greatest experiment that anyone's ever done in, in all of human history? Is that, the, is that the greatest one? I don't think there's a greater one. And also that fulfills every American boy's dream of being Frankenstein in the lab, surrounded with all this apparatus. I mean, when I was a kid, I was like, what are you, what's the happiest person? And it's the person who has multiple colored chemicals in test tubes and flasks, right. beakers, has tubes with liquid going through them, and then also has... Uh, the Jacob's Ladder uh, in, in the background and um, a, a Van der Waals the balls and whatever those things are. I was like, Jesus, I mean, that's don't you want that when you're a kid? Don't you want your room to be a laboratory? Because what are you doing there? You're playing with nature and making stuff. It's just advanced Lego. It's, it's like divine Legos. That's what it is. It's better than Galileo's balls, I'll tell you that. Could you explain <laughs> something to me? Because because it seems to me, maybe I'm out of date, so, so you could correct me if that's the case. Yes, it could make amino acids and a lot of basic 
elements, but they still haven't discovered how these are combined together to actually make life. Th these are raw materials that was necessary to be put together in their life. But they, they the, 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 there's another step. They only, have three, they only have three days. I mean, it took 4,000 million years. Remember that part? You know, I, how no, long did I, it take to get the first cell, the first copying anything, no, right? But, you know? but what, I'm, what I'm saying is that, but it's still, it's still chemistry. I mean, it's like I, I resent it a little bit that life is somehow reduced to better living through chemistry, you know, like, like another DuPont commercial. No, I think it's more than that. There's something else going on. Yes, you, you, you need that to create a, another kind of chemistry that was necessary as the building blocks for life. But that was not, those were not life. That's right, that's right. It's not the complete story. It turns out that some of the molecules actually had to be cooked in outer space. There's a book called Vital Dust by some famous experimental physicist. And it's like, but Bernowski goes on and says, surprisingly, today people are hypothesizing that ice is required as like a yeah, catalytic right. surface for the de for the, the concentration yeah. stuff actually it's weirder than that you need gamma rays and you need to be in a vacuum in order to make some of the other ingredients that we need wow that's, really? a, bummer. that's a bummer isn't it yeah so the most hostile it's worse than a volcano because we, we i mean there are animals that we can kind of understand that live off of thermal vents so that's that's already alien enough but imagine i mean what's what's worse than being torn apart by gamma rays in a vacuum in freezing cold space all alone. That's a freaking Okay, nightmare. a black a black hole, but then we're not getting that story produced yet. I mean, you know, if he were doing the black hole story, he'd be standing at the event horizon. This guy is not just right. a volcano <laughs> saying because there's no oxygen here. Ah, it's sulfur gas only. You know, it's amazing production. What is it's like these yeah. guys do the weather report, you know. Here's the worst hurricane <laughs> in the of Florida. Ah, he's he's talking about the gases, and he's wiping the condensation off his eyeglasses. Did you see yeah. that? That's awesome. I know. I, I was thinking the same thing. This guy was – like um, Bruno was a superstar. I mean, you, you see him walk through his house. It's like the coolest house um, in, really? in La, La Jolla, California. Like, he was a superstar, and you think – he gets on with BBC, and Scott brought it up before. He gets to basically monologue the whole show, you know, yeah. and they take verbatim what he's saying and write the book. But just think of it this way. Okay, I'm going to tell the producers. If I'm if I'm Bruno, I'm going to say, okay, where do you want to go next? Actually, we want to go to this volcano. What? How do we have no way of getting there? I don't care. We need to go to this volcano. <laughs> right? Like, yeah. he's I mean, taking like helicopter in the helicopter to well, me. He's taking all screen. over the world. There's been, yeah. he had carte blanche to do anything wherever in the world on like, um, Amazon. you know, what's that? The Amazon today. We were in the Amazon. The, the Amazon. But hey, you know what? This, this was funded. This could not have been funded without imperialism. <laughs> <laughs> Mozart too. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> but that flute player, there was already, I mean, that was sort of, we had the flute in this. That's right. Thank you for pointing out the good side of imperialism. Yeah, well, I'm still not going to buy it. <laughs> but I like to think this, this was the greatest high. This was the this was the ultimate peak experience for a teacher. Imagine being a super teacher and having his massive knowledge of everything. In fact, he, he was he was so well known for his know it allness that uh, the, the, he was actually in a, in a um, uh, Monty Python skit. So, um, so imagine being like the smartest English speaker in, in the world. And then you can put your lecturing body in any environment that you want and, and have a, a production team to, to like reproduce every experiment. And it's like, he must've been the happiest person on the planet during that year of filming. Like we have David Attenborough doing somewhat similar things in his field, right? I don't know, Cousteau was a, a bargain hunter, but you know, he, he did it himself. Yeah, these are, these are amazing people. Yeah, but and then oh. the, then the tragic the tragedy is is a year or two years after heart attack gone done, really too much yeah. wine, yeah, no, I don't know. <laughs> Did they publish his book after his death? <laughs> I just think about what he could have done. Well, I mean that's always the case, right? But you know, what, oh, there what else would he have done, right? I mean he's uh, he's yeah. amazing. Were there other series he uh, that he worked on? I don't know. Oh, 
I would no, love no. But the BBC did a similar series that's almost as good, but it's got a different vibe to it. It's those James Burke ones. Oh, I mentioned that to you in my email. So I was thinking about uh, doing doing the uh, the day the universe changed, and then uh, Dave suggested a series on uh, math, right? Islamic mm -hmm. science. Science, yeah, it's Islamic science. Right. So, uh, so but it's a very short one. So maybe we can do that next. But I, I want you to. I mean, has, has anyone seen James Burke's videos? I was checking. Oh it out. my God, you guys are yeah. gonna flip out. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's really good. It, it, it's like it's like they have a young version of Bruno that he talks like ten times as fast and he makes jokes every sentence. So that's what the series is like. Mm. Well, there was a there's a unit there was a professor that I was talking to at the univer at a, at the University of Hawaii, and she studies, um, uh, I guess, like Arab studies and stuff. So you know, that's somebody that we could, you know, I think she was interested in doing a series too. So yeah, well, maybe we'll do the, the, we can do the Islamic series next to to have a balanced perspective because I this is the, there was this, any, anything different I think would be good. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's different. Um, so the series, the new, the new BBC series, the, the newer guy, the younger guy, is he as linear making his points? He seemed, I was jumping around. I didn't see it. Was it, is it as linear or a concept as this? The ascent, the, you know, the, the progress of right. certain uh, stages. Oh. No, if you look at the, the different chapters, um, uh, he, he jumps around. But okay. it, is, it is so enjoyable. And he's, and he's just as articulate as Bruno. It's cool. it's really really incredible. So he did he did one series called uh, the day the universe changed. Before that, he did something called connections, and that was amazing. That's, that's where you talk about like the invention of the hot air balloon led to the creation of like glue, or like like folks the same glue. And he would actually take all the steps. They're like this particular battle uh, in uh, England in 1200 led to the invention of the Concorde, you know, airplane. And he just shows you all the steps. And you're like, oh my god! And and none of it is far fetched or silly. It's it's all completely. And he goes from place to place too, and they have even more money to spend. So the people are dressed up in armor and actually doing jousting and stuff, and they have everyone in costume. It's it's really good. Cool. So that so that one's called um, connections, and then there was connections two, three, and four, and then he got too old and they had to stop the show. So it, they repeated it three times because it was such a hit. Hmm. Interesting. But in the middle of this connections thing, he does this other thing called the day universe changed, and it's the most uh, the most Bruno like. It, oh, it, it talks about discoveries that were so shocking that it completely altered like the basic understa understanding, like the cultural like humans always have a filter to make sense out of things, and that default filter changes once in a blue moon. So he does those sh filter changes. Is that so, is that one is that one program or a series of programs? It, it's, it's 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 eight episodes. I think it's called the day the universe changed. But I'm telling you, oh God, James Burke. I mean, if you're <laughs> press, just put his voice on. He's so chatty and friendly and talking is just so great. The rhetoric, the art of rhetoric, right? He's just such a he's such a he's such a a teacher. Oh yeah, and he's and he's he acts like he has a joke, like like this is a, he's gonna do something like you're in on you're in on the joke with him, but he's never said anything. And so the whole time he's he's hooked you in like you're his sidekick or his wingman. It's 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 hard to explain, but I don't know. He's super charismatic. I mean, he's he's knockout charismatic. Yeah, for a Brit, for a Brit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's not physically good looking. His his, his head is bulbous because he has he, he has an abnormally large brain, so his head is odd shaped and he's bald. Um, Charlie Brown. Charlie oh. Brown. Yeah, a little bit. It gets, it could be cool. Yeah, let's we'll do that. So we yeah so we can do the Islamic series and then uh, we can do uh, the day the universe changed after that. Cool. What were yeah, we the Islamic series lo looks good. It's it's oh there's also BBC. Yeah, they, they changed their. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm so, I'm, I'm so depressed that I'm only watching stuff from the 70s and 80s these days because I'm trying to hold on to the last remnants of of the, my childhood. You know. <laughs> Well, I, I don't know what to what to, to fill in for curriculum or content for the Islamic series. We could ask that one professor, uh, David. Do you have any thoughts or Scott? Well, there, there were three videos from the BBC. They're each an hour, so I sent Scott the three links. It's it's one guy. He's a physicist, uh, basically uh, describing. I think he's Iraqi. You know, giving the background how these discoveries were happening in 
you know, during this period in Europe. And then here's what happened with, you know, the thought in Europe later and what documents were used and how they collected documents, the whole Islamic, you know, what did they do with science while they were taking over the land doing stuff? What was their attitude towards uh, knowledge, how they accumulate it and weigh this versus this religious versus this kind of natural knowledge? That sounds great. Yeah. yeah. As far as format, uh, Dave, uh, if you want, you could, uh, every time we do an episode, you can pick a couple of uh, time spans that you think are important and then send me the start time and end time. And then that, that could be one of the clips we show up because I know you're, you're a math expert. I mean, that's your thing. So, uh, so also, you're, you're super okay. knowledgeable about Islamic science. I remember from before you, I only know like I've been seen uh, in, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, geez, the Latin name. And that's so sad. Yeah, it, it, it been, oh, I can't, I don't even, it's so terrible. Anyway, so uh, so what you can do every week, Dave, is you can send me uh, like clip one, clip clip two, clip three, and then just give me the spans, and then it'll, it'll be my little set of things that I show, because you might find something super interesting that, that I don't know about, and you'll have little things to say, so you, so you can go off on a, on a tangent and say, actually, and, you know, because you'll have some insight. Actually, anyone can do that. Maybe that could be the format, maybe that could be the democratic element of this particular Meetup is that a pod luck, a pod that's luck. a really good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but somebody yeah. has to cut and paste them. You know, I don't know how to do that. I give you time frame. Oh, yeah, you, you, you just give you give me um it'll be digit digit yeah. colon digit digit with minute yeah, and yeah. seconds. That's it. Yeah, and then, then I have a I, I have a script I wrote and I just throw I throw the text, it's a command line thing and it spits them all out for me and the numbers and everything. It's, it's real nice. Is this Linux only or can I run this on my machine with Java? Oh, it's it's FFmpeg. And then, then you just make like a bash script and you run it from there. Cool. Trust me, David, he made me do it and it's pretty easy. Good. <laughs> Good. We can all become producers. Yeah, well, I'll just, let me type it in here. I, I know how to do this. I'll just type. It's like, I love it as the format to have anybody who wants to contribute, right? Does so, that make sense, Phil? Yeah, yeah that, that'd be great. That, that could be the, our, the secret sauce of our show is that everyone who cares or anyone who actually has something that they're dying to say about part of the show email me a time span and then I'll say, here is Joe Schmo's a clip. And that person gets to be a spotlight for a second. And that's really an important thing. And then you get to talk about your thing and people will feel uh, fulfilled because they're sharing something that they care about or something that they're ex experts in. Hey, Scott, um, I was going to say, um, do we, I don't think we overlap too many on, on, on clips, which I thought was odd, but there must two. be we have two clips tonight. Okay. And now, uh, Malka, that uh, includes you. Uh, you're obviously very bright, and, and you're interested in important things. So, if if you find some, some part of this thing that leads to something that you're interested in, even if it's tangential, if it's if it's plausible, if it's plausibly connected, then uh, send me the time span, and then I'll have it'll be part of our library of of spotlights. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's pretty cool. I get we're not on to any disputatious topics, so I guess we're sort of. Uh, yeah, we're, the, we're still doing. We're doing like I guess value neutral science stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. But of course, it'd be it'd be very exciting to to get in the ring with uh, important political stuff. You know that people get emotional, upset about. I think that that'd be good for me because I'm cowardly by nature. So I, I like to, to confront, you know, Jordan Peterson type characters. I, I you know. knew you were going to say Jordan Peterson. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so, you know, pe people that pose as intellectuals, but they're being you know paid by the right to, to kind of cover up stuff. I like to get with those people and expose them. But it's scary because they're well trained and they're practiced. You know, it, I'd be intimidated talking to Jordan Peterson. I know. We'll get the a segment where he says there's no such thing as toxic masculinity and then we'll tear it apart. I don't I don't know. What can you do with Jordan Peterson? Watch him in a dialogue with someone with an opposite opinion. Is that what you're saying? We'll see. Well, we'll see. Uh, actually, no, no, no. I would say if you're if you're qualified as a thinker and an academic, then he actually then he actually uh you know, he 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 uh pretty much revered Steven Pinker and if he's if he's if he, if you've got a leg to stand on and you've got some credentials and you're a good thinker um and he, you know he he plays fair ball right he tries he tries to you know have it a, a you know a fair conversation he, he right? speaks slowly and he acts like he's he's reflecting and then he he says either common sense stuff or just like 
really bad politics, but he does it in a common sense way, and he's speaking slowly, so it, so it looks really, really good. But but he had a debate with Zizek, who's a very bright guy, and then Zizek yeah. just, I mean, he, he couldn't respond to him because it was like it was like you know debating Donald Trump. All he can do is like flip his hair around and and, and like grunt. So Zizek just it, it had two parallel then, conversations. Then he went Marxist, 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 right? Called him. Yeah, but, but he did in a kind of a smarmy way, where he's like, you know, this this can be used for good. <laughs> or evil and i think this is very interesting it's very you know when people say interesting it means they hate it i don't know if you know about this it's very interesting it's very interesting. it's very interesting because i can see how the youth might be interested in in upsetting their parents by becoming involved in violent movements and probably getting shot by police because they're trying to help a bunch of black people who are lazy but it's bad, very face, interesting. bad face psychologizing i mean it's popularizing these the lingo of psychology for popular literature it's that really, you, you said he was going to be an honest broker in argumentation. That's not honest. No, no, that, he's, not, he's not honest. But it's his presentation is that he's thoughtful. So like, like one of the things he said, he's like, he says, you're a character. <sighs> and, and people laugh because it's an insult. He's like, now, now, now I, I don't mean that in a bad way. I think it's very, it takes a lot of courage to be a character. And um I think that it's very charismatic because a lot of young people are interested in, I don't know, becoming involved in violent revolution. And that could be a good thing or a bad. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. So he's insulting him, but it's by saying, I'm just showing you an object. I'm not, I, I don't know if it's good or bad. Who knows? I just thought I mentioned it. So it's like that. Ugh, it's, just, it's so smarmy like that the whole time. But he, he speaks slowly. So it looks like he, he's coming from a place of authenticity. It's amazing. You got to watch it. <laughs> I'm sure he's authentic to his own worldview. But it's just I don't know. sort of a shot on the screen. I don't quite have that same lens with him. Um, my my biggest issue with Jordan Peterson is that I'll go back to uh, Vancouver when I was living downtown in Vancouver with my wife and my son. Um, you know, he's um, he likes Jordan Peterson and uh, also Sam Harris, and they were having a debate. Okay, now this was on uh, this is a theological debate about God. And so my wife and I had tickets and I said to my son, who was 14 at the time, would you like to go to the event? Well, he was so excited to go to the event. Damn. And, um, you know, I guess he went, looked around. He's like the only child there, right? You know, he's the only young guy there. And, uh, you know, I my main concern with Jordan Peterson was the fact that he's too focused on a on a Christian apologetic, but that's my biggest barb there, is that there's too much pushing back to a Christian apologetic, and I push more back to, to Greek origin, right? In terms of if you're gonna if you're gonna push something back into society like a virtue ethic to say, well, what we really need is to go back to the you know fundamental Christian values that made American great again, you know where I'm going with that. But you the the idea is is that it's divisive in in a, in a on a world stage right and so i don't see that you have to have a you know a defensive all or nothing christian foundation i just don't i don't see that that's the worldwide gospel jordan peterson his best seller on amazon is a book on jungian psychology where it's kind of like learn about jung and then you can be super powerful so it's like tony robbins but if you, if you look at the book the, and, and the New York uh, Review of Books did a hilarious um, um, uh, review of the book, it's it's these bad, it's like he clipped out pieces of like medieval and Renaissance painting and then pasted them on a page and then drew arrows. And then the labels on the arrows are completely random. You have to see this. So it's, it's, it's astonishing that, that he actually is, is teaching in a university. So it's not only young, it's like, it's young in, in a way like the child didn't understand it. And he's throwing in these marketing terms like the masculine, you know. So he's what he's doing is what we all want to happen with young is we want to find like a collection of tarot card like images that we can look yeah. at and it'll it will stimulate us mythologically and turn us on. And that's what myth is for for Campbell, right? It's a non-intellectual, non-linguistic, being triggered by images so deep that the organism responds to them. So you look at a, a suicide on a cross or uh or you, you look at a, at a mother holding a baby and then you just can't help but having an emotional reaction. You pick up your car key, you pick up a gun, it affects your mood, it affects your state. So what you can do is you can have non-textual simulations of excitement. 
And so this is what he's selling. He's, he realizes there's yeah. a market for this. People want, people want like image based, picture based iconography, iconography, and stuff. <laughs> Yeah, people no, get right, that. Scott, I, the the analogy of the of the tarot card reading, you're right. It's like people want that, and he seems to be able to be the, um, you know, the medium to which can that that can offer that. And that I don't, I I just, I, I disagree. That's I that's another part that I don't agree with either. But I, li I like <laughs> occultism and Western Western mysticism, and, and I think it's great, and interesting. But he's just such a, ch a cheese master, and he has all this anti-trans. He's not going to say yeah. he's anti-trans, but it's just, but he, he realizes that that he can get, get funded from from um, from ruling class people who see him as uh, someone who can kind of insult. Yeah, but wait a minute, Scott. I don't think he's going out for funding on that. He's he just sells millions of books and books appointment. Like, I don't think he's going after funding from that sort of standpoint. He's just right, but, he, but he does cover his bases. You know, oh, I got some trans friends who said I'm allowed to say this. He does that stuff. Yeah, probably. You yeah. know, I mean, this no, 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 or, 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 not talking about sermon on the mount. No, Jesus, it, when you no, talk. it wasn't that. He was saying, he's saying, I will, I will say, I will, I will, um, I will say something to somebody based off of our relationship, right? Right. That's between yeah. us and them. I do not want to be legislated by the government to say that I have to say oh. that. That's where I draw the line because he sees it as. Free speech impingement. He sees it that's as right, that's right. Yeah, so, so he's taking the really silly issues that are called politically correct, which yeah. is a term that Marxists use to make fun of the failure of, of Marxism when people started looking at these little piddly bullshit issues, like you can't say that word. So it's just so sad. And G Jack's the first person to say that he's like, all this correct speech, and you know, don't use the word gay, it's not the right thing, all this stuff. That that's a sign that your real revolution has failed, and now you're you're finding a cultural battle instead. It's like it's so depressing. But so, so Peterson's uh, made his career uh, by, by doing this great move, inventing a non-existent threat called cultural Marxism. And all it is is just, it's a link by fiat. You have this PC bullshit speech control stuff on one side, which the people on the left are the ones that criticize first. And then you have Marxism, which is the real threat to the rulers because they, they want people to police themselves and, and, and accept lower wages. And then you just put things together and say it out loud in public. And then young Republicans at colleges will think you're a god. And that's what he did. Yep. 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 Great. No, well, honestly. Uh, uh, I'm gonna have to go, guys. I gotta. Go, I gotta go to you guys. See you later. I, 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 go ahead. Yeah, yeah, Malcolm. Oh, real quick, what I was gonna say is that uh, we were kind of talking before about oh, it'd be nice to be able to have debates with people from the other side, and here we're kind of showing an example of why that's very difficult to do because of the tactics that they use. And I, I feel like if we created some sort of incentive um, for them to say, okay, what are we getting out of this? Now, and there would have to be rules about respect. It literally could be like a courtroom where it's like, objection, they're using labels. Objection, they're using more than one point at a time, which is eating up the time, you know, whatever. But I, I mean, something to incentivize these crazy people. I mean, you know, I mean, unfortunately, you know, their incentives might be take money away from the homeless or, you know, urinate on a liberal or, you know, something, but you know, wh whatever it is to, to, to get these people in the room, but it could be worth it because at the end of the day, if it starts spreading, you know, again, we're the, I hate to say quote unquote, good guys, but you know, if, if they have their incentive, our incentive is okay. So now we've earned three more of your youth to come to the next debate and spread uh, you know, it's not about convincing. It's just about opening minds. It's just about going back and forth and saying, this is your point. This is my counterpoint. And uh, whoever doesn't have the counterpoint at the end loses. The end, it, it's simple as that. And that's just, it's just episode per episode. And I think it would be educational, fun, and, and kind of spreading, yeah. you know, slowly by, you know, bit by bit, uh, a little bit less ignorance, a little bit more hearing at least of the other side it's an interesting and challenging thing first it's challenging to make a process that would work although if both sides drafted it you know there is some idea that maybe there could be a common framework and a judgment made by like two parties one on each side that are both functioning as judging to keep it in bounds but with the, you're thinking topic-based discussion maybe even almost like a, a formal debate style way of discussing yeah. an issue that's interesting
Yeah, I think it's a good idea, and, and people would like if there are rules, then uh, then that would that would help because pe because pe people accept rules. You know, even even the bad guys will re will realize that there's rules rules of boxing. You know, yeah, I mean, maybe right. Well, so I think that that'd be a good way, and then uh, and then. Would there be like a winner? I mean, would that be allowed? So at the, at the end, there'd be, uh, I mean, that, I mean, I'm just wondering. So, so if one person. At, at the end, we can show the, the Monty Python uh, philosopher's soccer game. Okay. All right. Just something like that would diffuse the whole thing. <laughs> in, in England, they pull the audience to see who yeah. wins before and after, but. Then again, things can be rigged. I mean, honestly, uh, Jordan Peterson is being paid by the Koch brothers, so there's always money wins at the end of the day if you're not careful. The British show, I, I don't know, maybe it's not British show, they take an initial poll, and then they look at the differentials at the end. They take another poll, and they say, well, this went up 24 points, and this went down 13 points. So I guess that side was more compelling in changing minds. Oh, that's interesting. Pro, neutral, and against – and see how many shifts there were and say, well, there was more compelling. Look at the change. Something like that. As, as far as making these changes stick, uh, so Robert Hanna is uh, someone, he's a, a famous philosophy uh, professor in, in, on the left, like most philosophy professors are. And um, he, he, he often did these, uh, these uh, contemporary uh, moral issue classes like prostitution, abortion, gay marriage, euthanasia, all that usual stuff. And then he would. He said it takes years and years and years, and it has to be cumulative. So he would. He would spend an hour and a half going through points, and then at the end of the class, he's like, "We agreed on this. We agreed on this." And then everyone would be nodding their heads, and he goes, "Therefore, we all agree that this is the case, right?" So even the Republicans and stuff after class were like, "Yes, yes, we agree." Then the next Monday they would come in and then and they say, "No, I don't. I don't really believe that." And then they have to start <laughs> over again. So so even if you're right and you have an argument, and even if they agree with you. There's some chemical inertia that, that just washes that away. And 24 hours later, that little frat boy is back to being himself again. And it's like you made no progress. You're so right. You're right. There's like a, a mass uh, force equation for the brain with its inertia that, you know, you can apply a force, but you're only going to deflect it this much. And it's still on course, basically. A week later, you're going to see it was going where it was going. You barely deflected it. It's true. You're absolutely right. You have to measure that correctly, right? So the next Monday, yeah. he'd, have to, he'd have to start over, and he, he couldn't begin at the, on the last line of the proof from last week. He had to backtrack. And he, he thought it was incredible. I mean, how can a, a, a self-conscious person with memory and sanity say, yes, I agree that, that this is the case? And then 24 hours later, they say, no, 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 no. Oh, here's what they said. No, no, no. It's not really true. You tricked us using logic. That's what well, the wait, wait. That's kind of, that you know that's true. You know that's how you trick people because the concept has a certain appearance for each person and you only have to direct enough that they see how your concept is consistent with what they're asserting. They haven't changed their whole concept. And when they go back to their concept, they say, you know, that was very peripheral to my concept. I don't know why I really yielded on that point, because my concept has infinitely many things I contain in it, right? And, yeah, he slipped something in there. I'm not really convinced that he characterized my concept fully, but he made an argument. And, you know, on paper, it's, it's a syllogism. But it, it may not be, a, you know, metaphysically a compelling universal argument. You can get you go along. I mean, it, it, it's obvious these people are corrupt. They have no problem lying and, and doing all the stuff that you're talking about. But I would argue that um, what matters is who you're broadcasting to more than anything, the viewers, because that's that's it's a numbers game. You know, you think about um, you know when it comes to elections. And the undecided voters, and you know these people that are either centrists or whatever it is, um, that can be swayed one way or the other depending on the situation. I mean, yes, more and more of the time, we're hoping that some of these points, you know, kind of broaden people's minds. But I think the main thing is again to incentivize people to participate and people to watch. And you know, if it has to be a bit of a spectacle, so be it. But you know, what, whatever is going to get more and more of the time it's not going to happen in one generation you know all the changes we need to happen but at least if we can start turning heads a little bit in that direction 
And another idea that I just had, it might be really interesting, instead of it being a one-on-one debate, if it was like a team. Like, here's the question. You have two minutes during the commercial break to talk to the people on your panel that are on your side, and then you guys vote on which answer you want to counter with, and they and both sides would have that. It might give a broader, um, you know, kind of uh, way to, to do that. It's just a thought. It's a higher production value. You have to get people to be able to caucus. And, wh- and what if you had a behind-the-scenes component where on an overhead projector, you'd see the list of options they were choosing from, and numbers would appear in a left column showing which percentage of the team voted for which. And then on one hand, you'd be thinking like, no, 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 that's giving away ammunition. It's showing that there's strategy and it, therefore dishonesty behind the process. But we already know that. Both sides already know that. Both sides already know that, that, they're, that they're choosing. So maybe that would be some, that would be, it would enhance permeability or intersectionality or something to have. Transparency. Yeah, yeah. Which is a good thing. And, you know, they're not choosing the argument because it's the only right one. They're also choosing because it's compelling in this context, which means it's a little bit of a rhetorical thing. And we don't want to – you wouldn't want to – do you really want to make it a win or a lose thing? Or do you want to – it seems like it undermines its own integrity a little bit there. You know what I mean? But, but so, yeah. what would be the conclusion then? People, people like that. Wrap things up with some result. So, so what would be the result after each episode? And you kind of be like a playoffs. I mean, it's like okay, you made it to the semifinals, and so far the liberals are winning by uh, two debates. And uh, you know, I mean, who knows? It's it, again, does it cheapen it? Yes, but sometimes it's a trade off again. It's like what's going to get the rating and get more if you get more good out of the bad then i think it's worth it you could have you could have teams of four two teams or if it's dialectical maybe three teams and um give each team four awards they can give to the other side like you know loudest argument uh, no, you know, most <laughs> profound insight on a trivial point, whatever, you know, like or floppy doll that, you know, they can get four awards and then they get to sign to the other side, whatever rewards. And maybe that could be the finale as opposed to saying you won or lost or we respect you or I don't know. I mean, it should end up sort of mentally positive, shouldn't it? I, I mean, if you, if you made the question, is this a fair election we just had in 2021, you'd have facts about how many court cases you have facts about how many people were ready to testify that it was all you know bogus those are facts what are we going to do you know how are you going to you're going to weigh those facts you're going to have to argue that those are the right facts i think there'd have to be a ref there'd have to be there'd have to be a real ref who would say uh so so let's say there's a debate and then one side wins and then says no 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 but (laughs) <laughs> then, you, then you'd have to stop right there and you'd have to freeze. And for the viewers at home, you would show the argument and then you'd have an arrow pointing to the thing and then say, and then play the video of the person saying, and blah, yeah. blah, it's blah, blah. And then, th- then everyone would have to agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you make an artificially intelligent thing which would parse these arguments in real time and allow the logic chart to be displayed and developed as it happened? Yeah, we need Lieutenant Commander Data. Data. He's the guy. And what happens when you give a quantum argument? It splits into two meanings. I mean, that's really the conceptual problem. Your concept is this, and your concept is this, and I'm arguing this on the concept. I, it's not trivial. So maybe just letting people vote is your okay win or lose horse race. Yeah, yeah but don't you think there'll be people that'll always vote for their side no matter what happens? That's the that's the process. It's, you know, you, you, they, we're not giving away a million dollars. We're just points. So you have, you have 50 progressive and 50 Republicans, and they're the ones with the joysticks at home that determine the outcome for the debate. When would they ever switch sides? Well, well, here's the other thing. They, they've done these interviews of people that are, you know, you know, like super on the left or super on the right. And of course, it's I, I believe these were the people on the right in this instance where they gave them quotes, but they didn't say who said them. And oh, yeah. then depending on, you know, they changed their answer once they knew. So it's almost like if, if it was pre-recorded <laughs> and then they just voted first and then listened to it. I mean, who knows? It's, it's. Yeah, that'd be a good idea. You, you could get them to commit 
to certain staying with their principles beforehand, and then those could be used in some way. That'd be kind of fun. People at home would like that. People like exposure of contradictions. This, 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 this is a really good idea. This would be a good TV show. We need to keep it silent and then somehow get it get rights on it before we tell a producer. No yeah. one could do it. Don't worry. There's no one who can actually do. It. I mean, did you ever see Fred Friendly de conduct these debates about topics? There'd be, you know, a, at least a dozen panelists around. You know, people like Cokie Roberts and Donald Rumsfeld. I mean, you know, significantly involved people, and they, he, uh, you know, maybe William F. Buckley too. And then, you know, they'd be arguing for or against something, some hawkish question or something like that. And this guy could assimilate everyone's argument and come back at him with something i mean who's going to be able to do that kind of stuff it's just you really have to who, be who, who is this person his name god help us is fred friendly he's probably not still oh, alive. oh my god i thought that was the name of the brand okay. no check pbs the guy was marvelous oh my god Dude. that's incredible so, th so the show the, the show was canceled is that what you're saying no, he probably died 10 years ago. I'm an old guy. This was like these these fantastic debates on PBS. Holy crap. I had no idea. Check it out, Fred. Fred not, not a hard name to remember. Okay. I'm going to say good night. Okay. Okay. okay so, have a good night. This was a good talk. Oh, and yeah. last quick, quick, quick thing. We can call it, instead of the mass singer, the mass panelists. If they have mass, they're anonymous at first. That would really throw something in there they're not going for their pride you know the, you don't know who they are the moment jordan talks we'll all know who it is all right we'll see <laughs> okay so, good night everyone thanks for coming back i hope to see you next week okay bye 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 <laughs>